good to make a beginning with this uh, particular topic. As you know that whenever we do any activity in our life, we like to know the pros and cons or the risks involved uh, in performing that particular activity. Oh, I'm getting some messages here uh, for admission. So since I, I'm the host now, I know I'm getting, I started getting all these messages for admitting people. So, okay, I'll keep doing that as well. Okay. So if you want to buy a car, for example, you'd like to know whether it is safe to buy this car. Does it have uh, uh, enough uh, airbags? Does it give a good mileage? If you want to buy a house, then you're all the more careful. You want to know what is the risk involved in you know, buying a house from this particular property dealer. Likewise, in cardiac surgery and cardiac anesthesia, you like to know, not only you, but also the patient likes to know as to what is the risk involved. And we'll try to understand as to what that is during next uh, 45 minutes or, or around an hour. And uh, there are some drawbacks to this uh, presentation or the literature that is available uh, regarding the risk assessment. Number one, it is not meant for pediatric. I found that uh, pediatric risk assessment is entirely going to be different. It is only for adults. Secondly, it also has a lot of overlaps between cardiac surgery and non-cardiac surgery. I tried to separate them, but it becomes so difficult that I have uh, retained that overlap and it will be good to have that overlap, except that I will highlight as we go along the presentation. I'll make it clear as to which assessment is meant for non-cardiac surgery and which is truly for the cardiac risk assessment. So uh, let us start uh, with that introduction. Okay, I have nothing to declare and uh, let's try to understand why is the risk stratification important in our day-to-day -day practice. Number one and most important, uh, we want to understand the difficulties during, during the procedure and outcome uh, and anticipate the outcome of a particular procedure. So why this is required? Because we would like to, you know, uh, perform some interventions and improve the status of the patient by performing some additional investigations and introducing or starting some new therapies in order to you know, improve the outcome of a particular situation so that you can order some, uh, maybe you would like to have an angiogram or maybe you would like to have uh, MR uh, uh, assessment, cardiac MR of a particular patient or you can start the therapy like statin or blood transition if the patient is anemic or uh, there's a risk of uh, kidney failure. The statins have been known to you know, decrease that risk. Or in a patient with uh, COPD, you may start like to start the bronchodilators. In addition, you would... My slides are not moving properly because whenever I admit somebody, it starts creating problems. So I'm going to stop share and share again so that this problem is overcome. Right. So and it may be possible to alter the therapy or technique to reduce the risk. For example, if you want to uh, modify the myocardial protection strategy, then you can choose a particular strategy. If there is a LSVC, you may plan a particular cannulation technique. If uh, there is an aortic surgery or arch of the aorta, then you can plan the various cannulation techniques. And there are many things that you can do beforehand because deciding, taking such, such decisions on the table is rather difficult and also sometimes you can commit mistakes uh, uh, by taking the decisions uh, on time. Therefore, it is always good to see your patient uh, a day prior to surgery, understand the pathophysiology of the lesion and the type of surgical procedure and the various requirements that your patient is likely to uh, have and actually be prepared to deal with them. Lastly, you would like to have, a, give, have an informed consent. Now, can somebody else do this job of admitting the entrants? And whenever I admit the, uh, the new, new entrant, my slides stop moving. Anybody has any solution to this problem? Uh, I, th I think uh, from next time onward, 
So we were so appropriate informed consent is very important because your patient likes to know. He will always ask you as to what kind of risk is involved. If he doesn't ask you, it's your duty and responsibility to let him know that. Uh, especially on the part of anesthetist, I think it is very important if there is any if there is any uh, risk involved in terms of uh, uh, prolonged elective ventilation or if there is a patient already has a pre-existing neurological dysfunction or is at a higher risk of developing neurological complications, it is always better to for the anesthetist to explain to the patient that this is important and that you are likely to suffer from this particular complication because many patients and even doctors, unfortunately, even the doctors believe that, you know, uh, the, uh, the the neurological complications means a problem with the anesthesia. He hasn't woken up from the anesthesia. So uh, I'm getting lots of messages on my screen. So even the ACC AHA has uh, uh, you know made it very clear that uh, pre-operative evaluation the aim is should be not merely to give medical clearance. In fact. The use of terms such as the patient is cleared for surgery are not to be used. They, they discourage the use of such terminologies. Also, giving clearance to the surgery or anesthesia is a job of an anesthesiologist. It is not a job of a cardiologist. Many times we have seen, we used to, we used to do it very frequently earlier, but nowadays we have almost, we are not doing it that frequently that referred the patient to the cardiologist and cardiologist would write that patient is fit to undergo anesthesia. Now it is never a job of a cardiologist to say that whether the patient is fit or unfit to uh, for surgery. If there's any medical legal issue, the court is never going to pardon you because if you cite this particular sentence from the cardiologist, it is going to blame you for having done something wrong uh, for this patient. So it is not simply to, to give medical clearance. To give, give you an example, you may ask me why, so what kind of referral should we write to the cardiologist? For example, if the patient has got some kind of a conduction abnormality, you should write a referral to the cardiologist, specifically asking him to tell you whether or not the patient requires a preoperative pacemaker, temporary pacemaker. So you need to have a referral for, a, for the cardiologist to answer your specific question. If the patient uh, has suffered from acute MI or is hypertensive and he's on medical therapy, you may ask the cardiologist to clarify if the patient is receiving, if the medical therapy of this patient has been optimized or is there any need to add some more medicine or tweak, you know, or discontinue some of the medication. So that kind of uh, uh, referral should be written to the cardiologist or to any other, any other uh, specialist to whom you refer the patient. Now, again, my slides have stopped moving. So, you should perform an evaluation of the patient's current medical status. That is what is your job and see whether that is uh, conducive for the anesthetic management or not and make recommendations concerning the evaluation management and risk of cardiac problems over the entire perioperative period that is what uh, your job is you know to make an assessment of the course of the uh, patients uh, during the entire perioperative period and accordingly that will help you to make your own plans uh, in terms of your anesthetic management or post-operative management and also obtain a an appropriate informed consent from the patient. Now this is so. If I am the host, I think I have to keep on doing this. There must be some other way of uh, allowing. Uh, that, so that that is uh, that option. We have to subscribe for a higher uh, Zoom platform. That that is. Okay. Otherwise, uh, when I was presenting for the uh -huh. ICOP board, this uh -huh. has happened. This was happening. Okay. So the four people have entered the waiting room. So give me a time, uh, cutoff time. I will not allow anyone else to join then after that. So if I allow them to join, you know, I have to keep doing this again and again. So few people are waiting now in the Rajesh, room. Rajesh, we, so we have, have to take to... care of this next time. 
we have to add it all so if at the moment i do this uh, and mute all uh, yes okay so if i do that my st slides stop moving so i have to you know unshare and share again so stop share and share again right so let's start with the actual pre op assessment with that background and let's start with the demographic factors there are certain very simple demographic factors which all of us are very well aware of and which we know in our everyday practice and first of them is the age now the traditional cutoff value of 65 years may not be valid in the current uh, era where the average age of uh, uh, life expectancy has improved and the who classifies uh, the 65 cutoff as the young old you know the, the young old that's how what they say and the uh, actually old people are beyond 85 years of age so we may have to take into account after all age is uh, the age that we need to take into consideration is the physiological age and not the uh, the actual age in terms of numbers uh, but it has been shown to be a significant predictor of cardiac death following surgery. For example, if you are performing a CABG on an 80-year-old man versus a 60-year-old man, obviously the person who has got uh, who is elderly is likely to suffer from more morbidity and uh, mortality. And uh, it has been shown that they also that the response of elderly heart to stress is different. It is not as good as a young man, and there could be some down regulation of receptors. So the elderly heart may not respond to the stress that has been posed onto his or her heart as well as uh, that of a of a young person so this is an important factor although all these factors are not modifiable and in addition the elderly people will have some other associated age related diseases which could be anything any system may be involved maybe a patient has a cancer so that might influence your decision making regarding management he may be diabetic very common in cardiacs uh, cardiac anesthesia practice but any other organ may also be involved uh, while you are dealing with the elderly population and as i mentioned these are the uh, factors which are not modifiable if a person is elderly he is elderly you cannot do anything about it you cannot modify it next is the body size which means the body surface area and it has been shown that the obese patients carry a higher risk of death and uh, a BMI of 40, more than 40, uh, has been shown to have nearly 60% greater mortality than normal weight patients. This is one of the papers, but this has there has been a paradox recently with uh, the publication of this paper in circulation in 2017, which has shown that lower mortality in obese and increased, uh, there was a lower mortality in obese patients as compared to the normal patients and an increased mortality in, in the underweight patients. So one can understand the increased mortality in underweight patients, but lower mortality in obese patients as compared to the normal patients is rather paradoxical. And one may have to, you know, see, uh, look at this very carefully. Uh, at the moment, so there is not uh, any answer, exact ans answer to this question, whether the, the obese patients are uh, more likely to suffer from the uh, morbidity and mortality. The next is the sex. Uh, a female sex has been quoted as a risk factor for morbidity and mortality. Now, this is uh, rather surprising and also uh, one, uh, it makes us, at least me, very curious as to why this should be happening. Of course, there are some hormonal hormon issues which are different in a man and a woman. Otherwise, uh, uh, physiologically, we are almost similar. Uh, one of the other papers tried to say that it is the small body size and not the sex that increases the risk. So because the females are relatively smaller in size, that may be a factor for uh, increasing the risk. And uh, the recent evidence has, however, confirmed that females stand a higher mortality risk. Uh, here I am reminded of uh, the editorial written by Carpenter regarding the mitral repair. And he mentions in that editorial that the mitral valve is like a woman. Nobody has understood it. So it seems to me that uh, the sex is a female sex, at least uh, in the in terms of risk assessment, also uh, is a bit challenging and it is difficult to understand as to what what is the truth behind it. 
Previous myocardial infarction, yes, that is also one of the important factors. Now, all these factors are very simple and very common and we are, we are very familiar with them. But for the sake of completeness, I am, you know, referring to them one by one. Also, this is a teaching activity for the students. So, students also should be aware of all these factors. So, the previous MI, within six months, are the risk factor. Now, this is for non-cardiac surgery and although it holds true for even cardiac surgery, but there is a slight difference that I would uh, explain to you in a moment. So, if the patient has suffered from a previous MI within six months, that carries a high risk for non-cardiac surgery. And by improving your monitoring and management strategies in this scenario, you can decrease the risk in these patients, even of non-cardiac surgery. As regards the cardiac surgery is concerned, the patients currently are expected to undergo revascularization. They are not expected to suffer from myocardial infarction and they are at least expected to get thrombolytic therapy so that you know you do not allow the myocardium to die. That is what the current philosophy is and that is why what most of the people are doing, most of the cardiologists. Nevertheless, some patients would still present, they would not receive the therapy and they might present for uh, cardiac surgery, especially the coronary artery bypass grafting, and they do stand a higher risk if the uh, MI is within six months uh, of the surgery. And they also stand risk, but in, in, in contrast, they stand the risk of emergency procedure. If they suffer from acute MI, they do undergo emergency uh, myocardial revascularization and they may come for emergency CABG, and which is by itself a risk factor for them in terms of uh, the fact that they would be on anticoagulants or antiplatelet agents, they might be hemodynamically unstable, they might have reached the cath lab for angioplasty or angiography, and uh, the uh, angioplasty or stenting may have failed and therefore uh, is being referred to surgery. So they stand a, a distinct group of individuals who will have to be dealt with separately and as we proceed uh, during this presentation, you will see what are the other factors that are responsible for increasing the risk of morbidity and mortality. And uh, one can apply those criteria even in a scenario of uh, emergent surgical procedure. Next is the presence or absence of anjana. As you know, there are types of anjana, stable, unstable, and variant anjana. Stable anjana is the one which appears uh, excruciating pain or it classical pain in the chest which radiates to the to the mandible or to the left left arm and is relieved by the rest or taking nitrates. Unstable anjana does not have relation to the activity and is not relieved easily. It is it is prolonged, it lasts for longer than the usual 15 to 30 uh, minutes that the stable anjana lasts for. And the variant of the prismatal anjana has no relation uh, to the activity. It can happen at rest also. So depending upon the uh, the type of anjana, it has been shown that the unstable anjana and the variant anjana, if they present for non cardiac surgery, they are the ones who need to be investigated further in greater detail and they do stand a higher risk of uh, non cardiac surgery. So, the anjana essentially needs to be evaluated for patients who are undergoing non cardiac surgery. For cardiac surgery, the patients are usually nicely evaluated and they will be investigated and they will present for uh, coronary bypass grafting. Now, the risk of perioperative MI in non cardiac surgery is enhanced if you have a stable or unstable angina, and that's a different uh, subject matter altogether. And uh, uh, depending upon the, the urgency of the non cardiac surgery, sometimes you may have to operate on patients uh, with a history of angina without subjecting them to the treatment of coronary artery disease by way of uh, stenting or coronary artery bypass grafting. And some of them may, may not uh, require stenting or CABG and can be managed medically and they would still be subjected to non-cardiac surgery. So you will have to take into account their uh, cardiac status uh, uh, or the risk of uh, myocardial infarction during the perioperative period this risk is higher and carries a higher morbidity and mortality. So there is a different method of uh, managing these patients, especially those who are undergoing the major non-cardiac surgery. Now, hypertension, often we see that uh, the patients who show uh, uh, hypertension during the preoperative period or on table, there is a tendency to you know, postpone these patients. But as a cardiac anesthetist, I do not remember that we have ever postponed a patient if you found that the uh, blood pressure is higher on table. In fact, they need to undergo surgery. Uh, such patients such as uh, coarctation of aorta, they will have higher blood pressure because nowadays we have phase and means and therapies at our disposal which can very quickly, you know, control these uh, 
hypertension, hypertension in these patients. But in non-cardiac surgery, often the patients are postponed and there are some papers which try to address this issue, whether on-time cancellation or postponement of the surgery is desirable or not, or correct or not. And it has been shown that it is uh, desirable or it is uh, correct only in situations where the, the, the target organs uh, organ ha ha have been involved, such as kidney and brain. So the hypertension has affected the kidney function and the brain function uh, and the cardiac function, of course. So, so if he comes for cardiac surgery, he has a cardiac dysfunction, but if he's not coming for cardiac surgery, he may have a brain or kidney dysfunction. If that is the scenario, only then you are justified in uh, postponing that particular case and have a better control of hypertension and uh, better evaluation only in elective surgical procedures and then subject him for the non-cardiac surgery so that you will minimize the risk of morbidity and mortality. And uh, you might recall that the ACC and AHA uh, guidelines uh, suggest that uncontrolled hypertension is only a minor clinical predictor and it is not taken into account uh, in the algorithm that the ACC AHA has suggested for the management of uh, non-cardiac uh, surgical patients. Diabetes, another important uh, parameter or factor which is very commonly seen in patients who undergo cardiac surgery. It is a risk factor for coronary artery disease. By itself, it is a risk factor for coronary artery disease. It is also a risk factor for silent myocardial ischemia. So this is especially important in patients who undergo non-cardiac surgery. They may suffer silent myocardial ischemia and hence the myocardial infarction and the risk will be increased in these patients. Also, they can lead to diabetic cardiomyopathy so that the cardiac function can be depressed in these patients. There is also a risk of perioperative infection. So the wound infection and other things can happen in these patients, thereby increasing the morbidity and mortality. And it has been defined as a potential predictor of perioperative morbidity. So a diabetic patient by itself is a potential candidate to suffer from higher morbidity and mortality. Now, previous cardiac surgery, you also need to take into account whether or not this is the first cardiac surgery or uh, it is a previous cardiac surgery. Now, there are four people are waiting in the waiting room. I think I will admit them so that, uh, you know, they can be a part of this activity. But which also means that I have to stop sharing and share again if my slides do not move. Yeah, so I have to stop share. Share again. So previous cardiac surgery is an important uh, risk factor. Why? Because in general, the patients are sicker. The very fact that they are undergoing the surgery for the second time, it means that they are sicker than the, those patients who will be undergoing surgery for the first time. Then they, there is a risk of adhesions. As you know, in black population, uh, we are not black, but we are definitely brown, not uh, the white population. The white population have uh, very, uh, you know, the adhesions are not dense in white population, but in our population, Indian population, the adhesions are very dense. And there is a lot of risk of uh, bleeding when the surgeon is trying to separate those adhesions. And also because of the excessive handling by the surgeon, it leads to risk of arrhythmias. In addition, the patients may be on anticoagulants because it's a redo surgery, maybe a redo valve surgery or coronary bypass surgery. And the patient may be on certain antiplatelet agents or anticoagulants. And therefore, uh, they, they stand a risk of higher bleeding in addition to the risk of bleeding that is because of the adhesions. Then because the surgeon is not able to you know, mobilize the entire heart, and so therefore the, the maneuvers that he performs to tear the heart at the end of the procedure may not be adequate, especially in patients who undergo valve surgery or congenital heart defects, thereby exposing them to the risk of air embolism at the end of the bypass. So these are the various categories of risks that the patients who undergo a repeat surgery they carry and uh, we should take measures to minimize them or at least explain to the uh, patient what are the risks involved. What measures we are supposed to take that's not a part of this presentation and would be subsequently covered in different uh, uh, presentations. At the moment, we are only talking about the various factors that increase the risk of morbidity and mortality. 
Now the combined procedures. To some of you, let us say, say for example, a patient who is undergoing only CABG versus a patient who is undergoing CABG plus mitral valve repair. The risk of surgery if the patient is undergoing a combined procedure is higher than that of a patient who is undergoing only the CABG. And therefore, and now we, after having understood this, some of the demographic factors which actually tell you the risk assessment but does not tell you exactly what is the quantum of this risk, what is the percentage of patients that are likely to bleed versus the patients who are not likely to bleed in a patient who is undergoing reoperation, or how much am I going to bleed, or what is the risk of morbidity, how much will be the increase in the length of stay. So that kind of quantification is not possible. On that, you can say that there is a mild risk or a moderate risk or a higher risk, or the risk is higher as compared to a patient who doesn't, doesn't have that particular problem. For example, in an elderly patient, you can say that you have a higher risk than a patient who, who was uh, 50 years old. That kind of you know, uh, risk assessment you can tell the patient or for yourself, but you cannot actually quantify the uh, risks. Therefore, there are certain risk indices that have been now uh, in vogue and many of us are uh, used to referring to the risk indices which try to tell you uh, exactly as to what kind of risk is there, uh, what percentage of risk is involved, what percentage of uh, patients that are likely to die. For example, some of the risk uh, uh, indices would tell you that the possibility of death is about 5%. But it, it still does not let you know whether the, this particular patient belongs to the, that 5% or the 95%. So that lacuna will still be there. And this is what is the medicine is. You know, medicine is a game of probability. You can only talk in terms of probability that this is more likely to happen, this is less likely to happen, or this is unlikely to happen. Whether it will happen in your case or not, that we are still not able to tell to the patients or to ourselves as well. So there are certain indices, uh, classification of anjana, for example, or functional capacity is ASA and NYHA classification is there. Also Canadian Cardiovascular Society has, you know, classified the anjana and the, uh, the functional capacity. Also there is Goldman uh, risk index, which was used earlier, not uh, used very much nowadays, but uh, it is there. And uh, also uh, if you look at the NYHA risk assessment or the, or the functional capacity, there are again some people waiting in the waiting room. Uh, hold on for some more time. Let me complete this. So this is a functional classification given by NYHA, New York, New York Heart Association. So a patient with cardiac disease, but no limitation of activity. So he can perform all his activities. He is a class one. Patient who has cardiac disease, but leading to slight limitation of physical activity. So there's only slight limitation, class two. And if there is a significant or marked limitation of physical activity, that is class three. And class four means he is not able to carry out his any physical activity. So the, this is a, a class three and four, they constitute a very, uh, class four is the highest risk, class three and four are uh, high, higher risk uh, uh, patients. Class one and two are mild to moderate risk. That kind of classification can be applied uh, for clinical usage. Now my slides have stopped moving again. So let me do this once again. So we talked of the NYHA classification, then there is a least revised cardiac risk uh, index, which is uh, nowadays commonly you know, utilized and used in our day-to-day -day assessment. And also ACC AHA has utilized this for the algorithm that they have proposed for managing the patients uh, who have cardiac disease and uh, are subjected to non-cardiac surgery. So the presence of ischemic heart disease, history of congestive cardiac failure, history of cerebrovascular disease, insulin therapy for diabetes, preoperative serum creatine in more than 177 micromoles or 1.5 milliequivalents, and uh, high-risk surgery if the patient is undergoing high-risk surgery in which vascular surgery is included. So these are the six risk factors which you know define the uh, risk that the patient is likely to have if he's undergoing non-cardiac surgery and also cardiac surgery and the 
presence of uh, no risk factor means there is a zero uh, or one uh, risk factor, zero or one uh, risk factor predicts uh, the risk, low risk of uh, major adverse cardiac event and to the tune of 1%. And the, if it, there are more than two uh, factors are present, then the, there is elevated risk of uh, major adverse cardiac event, which is more than 1%. Now, major adverse cardiac events mean death or myocardial infarction. So, perioperative MI and death, uh, they come in the category of major adverse cardiac event. The risk is less, less than 1% if there are there's, there's no risk factor or only one risk factor and more than one. Don't know how much more than one, whether it is 2, 5, 10, 50, 100, we don't know, but it is more than one. And so in, in order to understand whether how much more than one, you may have to take into account certain other parameters of the patient and which we, I, I will discuss in the uh, subsequent slides. Now, the more important than the various risk indices, the functional status of the patient is very important. In my view, if we want me to provide you one parameter which will indicate the risk involved in the patient undergoing cardiac surgery, it is the functional status. So if I cannot perform any activity, I stand a very high risk. If I can run for 10 miles, I do not stand any risk or very less risk. There is a rider to, to this because some of the uh, patients who have suffered from coronary artery disease or aortic stenosis, they are asymptomatic or they have a very good functional capacity, although they carry a uh, very uh, severe kind of disease. And that's the reason why you have certain deaths in some of the patients. And uh, you come to know that he has a, a inherent or indwelling uh, uh, coronary artery disease, which remained undiagnosed because he was asymptomatic altogether. So, but for this, these exceptions, functional status is a very good parameter. So it is measured in terms of metabolic equivalent of task and one met equals to the resting oxygen consumption of a 40 year old uh, man, a 70 kilo man. So that is the uh, equivalence uh, metabolic equivalent means and if the met is less than four if a particular patient is able to meet a metabolic equivalent of less than four he is a poor he stands uh, he has a very poor class of functional activity and stands a high risk of surgery and the person who meets a met of more than 10 has got an excellent functional capacity and seven to ten is good functional capacity and four to six is moderate functional capacity now how do you assess this functional capacity you need to ask certain questions to the patients and perioperative cardiac and long-term risk is are increased in patients who are unable to perform uh, activities which are uh, conducive with less than four metabolic equivalent so in order to be able to assess how much activity the, uh, the patient can perform, you need to ask certain questions to him. So here is a scale from one met to four met. So if you can take care of yourself, eat, dress, or use the toilet, then that is one met metabolic equivalent. If you can do light work around the house, such as dusting, washing uh, dishes, etc., then you, uh, you have a four met equivalent capacity. And if you can uh, participate in strenuous sports like swimming, singles, tennis, football, maybe then you have a metabolic equivalent of 10. And so you are a very good risk. And from 4 to 10, these are the various other activities. So this is how you can find out what is the functional capacity of an individual patient. Now, in cardiac disease, you might know that some of the patients are not able to perform activity because of some other disease, such as you have arthritis. So there is a knee joint arthritis is there. So the patient is unable to walk or run and so you may not be able to assess the uh, uh, functional capacity of the patient. So there are different ways such as dobutamine, stress, echo and other activities, other things that can be performed to assess these patients. Now you also have Duke activity status index or score, uh, which is another way of uh, uh, calculating the metabolic equivalent or the functional capacity. So there are a list of questionnaire and the score is given for each of the activity and you can convert this into metabolic equivalents. And the score of 34 represents a th threshold for patients at the risk of MI and moderate to severe complications and a new disability. So uh, the Duke activity uh, status index score is another very good uh, method of assessing the functional capacity. And here are the questions and the markings that are given on the right of your screen. So can you take care of yourself, walk indoors and do these activities? So a maximum score of 58 and around 34, as I mentioned, is the cutoff limit for 
uh, the increase in the risk of uh, surgery. So the morbidity and mortality is higher if the score is less, the functional capacity is poor if the score is less. So that's another method of uh, uh, measuring the functional capacity. The, the, the last one is the six minute walk test, which also was very actively uh, perused during the COVID time. And you might have heard of six minute walk test being asked, the patient is being asked to perform six minute walk test, means he's uh, asked to walk for six minutes at the speed. Hmm? There is some disturbance here. So, so six minute walk test, the patient is asked to walk for six minutes at the speed that he wants to talk, walk uh, at and uh, the way he likes to walk. And if there is a decrease in saturation of 3%, then he is a, not a good risk uh, in terms of COVID, management of COVID. But here we are talking of uh, the cardiac risk assessment. And here this test has been validated. This uh, publication in British Journal uh, in 2012 has given a cutoff limit of 563 meters. Now this is a very, uh, what should be a very, very accurate or very uh, stringent cutoff limit. So you actually measure the meters in, it's not a round figure. It is not 500 or 560 or 550, it is 563 meters. And if you can walk for a distance of 563 uh, meters, no further testing is required. And if you can walk less than 427 meters, then you need further evaluation. So stress testing is required in you. And if you are between 427 and 563 meters, then there is a uh, uh, clinical risk factors and magnitude of surgery should be incorporated. So you need to take help of other uh, factors in order to understand the risk that this patient is uh, likely to be exposed to. Again, in patients who are suffering from cardiac disease uh, due to other reasons, they may not be able to perform the uh, walk test as has been mentioned there. But it's a fairly uh, simple and very useful clinical tool. You don't need a dovitamin stress echo to understand, at least in these two groups of patients, those who can walk 563 meters and those who cannot walk 427 meters. In these two categories, you know it for sure that dovitamin stress test is required or not required. So very simple and useful clinical parameter, uh, in my opinion, uh, although we do not use it as frequently as one should. Uh, then, so let us uh, look at some of the risk factors uh, specific to the cardiac surgery. And uh, the most important is the ejection fraction. Tell me how many of you have not asked, uh, uh, tried to know the ejection fraction. In fact, this is the first question that the anesthetist asks to the surgeons or the patient or the, when he looks at the echo, when the junior is presenting a case to the senior, the senior wants to know what is the ejection fraction. He is not satisfied unless he is uh, informed about the ejection fraction of the patient, which is a very good marker. And it has been shown that it's a very good predictor of cardiac risk in patients who undergo cardiac surgery. And therefore, it is the, uh, the only parameter, only echocardiographic parameter that must be performed in all echocardiographic examinations. And uh, therefore, ACCH recommends that it should be a part of each and every echo examination ejection fraction because it has got a very good predictive value. Then you should also try to understand whether there is unstable angina or recent MI, which I have discussed already. Then whether or not there is clinical evidence of heart failure. This is very important parameter. So if your patient has got heart failure, if there are crepitations in the chest, the patient with uh, mitral stenosis or patients with coronary artery disease, there is a cardiac failure in these patients. Now he, a patient who's cardiac failure is not being relieved by medication is definitely a, 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 a very significant risk factor uh, for the patients to be subjected to the cardiac surgery. I think there are some more patients or the people waiting to admit. Let me admit those and let us let us see if my slides move. No, they don't move. So there is one more person. I admitted him also. Then I'll, now I'm going to wait for some more time before I admit anybody else because it interrupts me. So ejection fraction, unstable angina, clinical evidence of heart failure. These are very important parameters. Age more than 65 years, severe obesity, emergency surgery, uh, reoperation, 
and other systemic disturbances. So these are some of the risk factors specific to the cardiac surgery. And these were described by Parsonet in way back in 1989. And they are not practiced uh, as much as they were earlier because things have changed. Just, just as I mentioned, age more than 65 years needs to be revisited. And the, uh, things have improved in terms of our management of the patients who are undergoing uh, emergency surgery or reoperation or those with other systemic disturbances. So Parsonet score is not as frequently used as uh, it was earlier, but for the sake of completeness, I have included it. How do you evaluate that score? If the, the risk is normal, if there are no risk factors uh, present and the mortality is 0.4%. So here is a uh, scoring system which actually provides you the, uh, uh, the risk uh, uh, in terms of the uh, actual percentage in terms of the figure here, numbers. And there is an increase in the risk. If one of the factors present, uh, then the risk is uh, more uh, is uh, of mortality is 3.1%. And there is a high risk of mortality of 12.2% if two or more factors are present. But as I mentioned that these risk factors are, many of them are modifiable and they have been modified and we have improved in managing these uh, problems in our day-to-day -day practice. So I would not really uh, give much of importance to these numbers and the percentage score in the present day clinical practice. Although it is a good scoring system that was presented about 30 years ago and was a practiced uh, for a fairly long duration of time. Now, Society of Thoracic Surgeons have uh, given some scoring system and uh, they have identified 13, 13 risk factors. And this is a relatively recent in 2013. And the cardiogenic shock, renal failure, and reoperation were labeled as those carrying significant risk. So they identified three risk factors. So if your patient has got these three risk factors, then he is likely to have a higher risk of morbidity and mortality. Then you have Euroscore, of course. This is a better scoring system because, again, it tells you the risk. It, it quantifies the risk. Uh, unlike most others, it, it is able to quantify the risk. And the, the, you can go online and uh, fill up the performa, and uh, it will tell you the, the risk of in-hospital mort mortality after major uh, non-cardiac surgery. So it's also a very good scoring system. I will not go into the details, but you need to fill up the data such as age, the type of disease, the history of MI, history of uh, if there is a patient has got diabetes, if the patient has got history of CCF, and all these parameters that we have discussed so far, they have need to be entered into this performa, and it calculates the risk that the patient is likely to suffer from in terms of mortality. So remember that this scoring system provides you the risk of mortality in these patients. Then there are two newer tools of risk assessment, and these are for the patients who undergo non-cardiac surgery, and these are National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, myocardial infarction, cardiac uh, arrest, and the NSQIP short form, and the uh, it also has got a, a online uh, risk calculator, so you can visit this site and enter the details of your particular patient and the type of surgery that is being performed in these patients. And you will get the actual risk assessment in these patients. So I've tried doing this in some of the patient, patients and it does tell you the, it quantifies the risk uh, in terms of uh, the morbidity and mortality. So these are the various risk assessment uh, scores. Then we move on to the another important parameter that is the cardiac status or the severity of the disease. It is very simple and logical to understand that if the severity of the disease is more, then the risk is likely to be more. For example, if I have suffering from a mild mitral stenosis versus severe mitral stenosis or moderate uh, aortic stenosis versus severe aortic stenosis, the risk of is increased if I am suffering from the severe disease. Likewise, if I am suffering from, uh, uh, now the risk assessment here is slightly different for, for patients who suffer from coronary artery disease because it is not in terms of the number of vessels involved. The number of vessels involved may be four or five, but the myocardial function may be preserved in these patients because they were thrombolyzed on time and they, they were you know, looked after well uh, before the surgical procedure. So the, in the patients who suffer from coronary artery disease, the risk, uh, the severity of the disease in, is not in terms of the number of vessels involved, but the amount of myocardium that has been damaged by the coronary artery disease. So remember this difference. And the, as I mentioned, the risk is proportional to the severity of the cardiac disease. 
and congestive heart failure as i mentioned in coronary artery disease it is due to lv failure and lv failure depends on the amount of myocardium that has been damaged so a single vessel disease even can be a great uh, patient can be at a greater risk if a significant part of the myocardium has been damaged it has, it has infarcted because he was not treated properly versus a patient who has got three or four vessel disease but who was treated properly and he got admitted to the hospital in time and he did not suffer from myocardial infarction so the myocardium is preserved and it is performing well so he does not stand uh, the, the, the risk involved in him is not as high uh, as as the patient who has suffered from a myocardial infarction so uh, this is uh, as against this, in patients who suffer from valvular heart disease, the, the assessment of risk is slightly different. As I mentioned, the symptoms are dependent on the loading conditions. So, for instance, in a patient who has got suffering from aortic stenosis, if he presents to in early stages, although he may be suffering from severe aortic stenosis, his myocardium still may be contracting very well because his, it is hypertrophic and it is trying to overcome the resistance offered by the stenosed valve so after the surgery the, suddenly the heart will find itself very comfortable because the stenosis has been removed so here the interpretation of the uh, disease severity is not in terms of the severity of the valvular lesion but this uh, the, the amount of the uh, concentric hypertrophy that the patient has and the degree of diastolic dysfunction that the patient has suffered from so this is very important uh, maybe i'll in uh, one of the slides uh, next few slides i will discuss this issue in greater detail and in patients who suffer from my, uh, mitral regurgitation for example you uh, you know that the uh, in these patients the uh, lv is able to empty the uh, empty itself into the low chamber pressure which is the left atrium so the ejection fraction here uh, overestimates the lv performance and therefore the cutoff limit for poor lv function or myocardial dis dysfunction in patients who suffer from myocardial regurgitation is 60 percent so so if you if you are dealing with a patient who has got a uh, who has got severe mitral regurgitation but has got a ejection fraction of 50 percent or 55 percent even that can be considered as poor LV function because we overestimate the ejection fraction in patients who suffer from uh, mitral regurgitation. So you must take into account uh, these kind of specific aspects of a particular disease while you are evaluating the severity of the disease as a marker for the uh, predicting the morbidity or mortality or the risk evaluation in a patient who is undergoing the surgery. So I hope uh, uh, it is clear to the postgraduates and because of the uh, online mode of this presentation, I'm unable to see any, any faces and I'm unable to understand whether the people are understanding or not. But uh, that's the drawback of this uh, mode of uh, presentation. But the advantage is I'm able to speak to many people at any given time without traveling anywhere. I'm sitting in my room and making this presentation. So anyway, so uh, so let us discuss aortic stenosis. I, as I was trying to mention that in aortic stenosis, you should understand certain issues such as low flow, low gradient, severe aortic stenosis. Now, as you know, when the uh, gradient is high, it means that the stenosis is severe because the for uh, for the flow to be achieved beyond the obstruction, the velocity has to be increased because the passage that is available is now narrowed. So the velocity is increased and because the velocity is increased, the gradient is increased. So we are assuming when we say that the uh, gradient is, mean gradient is 50 millimeters of mercury and uh, if the gradient is 40 millimeters of mercury, we are assuming that the stroke volume is same. So when you assess the gradient in terms of the severity of the disease, you must take into account the flow across the valve. So if the flow across the valve, if the stroke volume is decreased, the gradient will decrease, although the stenosis may be still severe, but the gradient will decrease because the flow is less. And that is where you, the, uh, the entity called as low flow, low gradient, uh, severe aortic stenosis comes into picture. So if I have a patient who had a gradient of, uh, a peak gradient of 100 millimeters of mercury today, and uh, after six months I follow up and I see that the gradient has decreased to 60 millimeters of mercury, it does not mean that the stenosis has improved. It means that the stroke volume has decreased. The heart is not able to cope. So the flow has decreased, velocity has decreased. The flow or the stroke volume has decreased. Therefore, the, uh, the gradient has decreased. So you would like to define whether 
you are looking at a patient who has got a low gradient, but on the planimetry or continuity equation, if the uh, valve area is less than one centimeter square, you would like to know whether this is this patient belongs to low flow, low gradient entity or not. And for that, you perform a dobit mean stress echo. And if you find that the peak flow or the gradient increases to or peak flow increases to more than four liters per meter, uh, meter which means that the gradient has increased and the valve area remains less than one centimeter square, that means he's a, that's a true severe aortic stenosis that you are dealing with. Whereas if you are, you find that on the between stress echo, you need to, you know, measure the gradients and the valve area every, uh, every five minutes, or you, or you increase the between dose in the increments of five micrograms per kilo per minute, and uh, you assess the uh, patient every five minutes in terms of the uh, uh, peak flow velocity and the valve area. So if the valve area remains more than one centimeter square and there is no significant increase in the gradient, that means you are, that's a pseudo severe though. So the patient does not have any aortic stenosis. The gradient was, had decreased because the flow had decreased. And this is how you can distinguish by performing the dobitwin stress echo. And there's one more entity, which is the paradoxical aortic stenosis. As you might understand that in a patient who has got severe concentric hypertrophy, the LV cavity becomes very small. So the, so the stroke volume decreases because the preload is less. So the LV is not able to accommodate sufficient volume. Therefore, the stroke volume is less and therefore the gradient is less. So this is differentiated by looking at the ejection fraction. So if you see that the patient has got a good ejection fraction, more than 50%, but the valve area is less than one centimeter square and the mean gradient is less than 40 millimeters of mercury. That means he has got a paradoxical AS. He does not have a true aortic stenosis because his gradient, his, uh, well, uh, his, his gradient is less because the ejection fraction is, uh, is more. So his ejection fraction is more, but he's hypovolemic. Therefore his uh, gradient is less because the stroke volume is less. So I hope I have clarified these three issues, the uh, true severe, the pseudo severe, and the paradoxical aortic stenosis. Also, there is one more entity which might confuse you further. Uh, in patients uh, who do not have any reserve, you know, those patients who cannot increase the output despite administration of dobutamine, they do not have any reserve and they will not increase their peak flow to more than four liters and they will continue to have, have aortic stenosis. And this is the class of uh, group of patients which is difficult to, you know, uh, understand and manage. So, uh, 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 patients who who uh, who cannot you know improve their uh, uh, cardiac output or stroke volume by dobutamine, they do not have any cardiac reserve, and they are very high risk patients for subjecting them to aortic stenosis or aortic valve replacement surgeries. Nowadays, you also perform the the TAVI or the TAVR as we like to call it. The second uh, part uh, of uh, the cardiac specific to the cardiac disease is the arrhythmias. Now, this is a very important parameter and is, uh, this assumes importance in patients who suffer from coronary artery disease because it is one of the leading causes of sudden death in these patients. And uh, those patients who suffer from atrial arrhythmias, especially atrial fibrillation, they have been shown to have increased mortality, duration of ventilation, infection, acute kidney injury and ICU and hospital length of stay. All this is related to the thrombus formation in the in the left atrial appendage in these patients which may embolize and will lead to neurological complications and therefore the length of uh, stay in the hospital and all other problems that these patients face. So arrhythmias is a very important clinical parameter which tells you the uh, risk that is involved in these patients. Then the priority of care, which is also very important. Uh, so the, if the patient is undergoing elective surgery versus uh, the urgent surgery. Now I've tried to classify these uh, here because many times uh, uh, I have seen the students and even the doctors getting uh, consumed. What is elective surgery? What is, what is urgent and what is emergency surgery? So I found some literature which actually tries to differentiate this. So elective surgery is the one which can wait for one month. So in COVID era, we, you know, canceled all the elective surgeries. So all these patients were, could be delayed for a period of one month. And at the end of one month, you assess them again and you again found that they can wait for another month. So you do not subject them to surgery. So that is the elective surgery. Urgent means it, it can be operate on, operated on a next working day. For example, you are on the weekend, on Saturday, a patient with left atrial myxoma presents. 
then he can be operated on next working day that is the monday of course there could be local issues involved in taking such decisions but in the scientific terms urgent surgery means the one that can wait for uh, till the next working day of the hospital so unless the left atrial myxoma has you know detached itself from the left atrium and is now is, is part of it is being seen in the lvot then that becomes an emergency and it should be operated within 6 to 8 hours but for all other practical purposes those are the type of examples i am giving you to understand the terms elective versus urgent and emergency surgery would be usually within 6 to 8 hours so there is no time provided by this patient patient suffering from acute mi for example now he needs to be operated revascularized as soon as possible and they carry the higher risk of morbidity and mortality so it is very simple to understand that those patients which undergo a planned procedure will have less risk as compared to those who undergo a, a procedure in emergency so because they provide very less time to optimize their condition then physiological derangements may be present in these patients who undergo emergency surgery such as they may be hypovolemic they may have acid base disturbance and any other thing can be there so they may be uh, on iibp for example so they have such a uh, a uh, great degree of uh, hemodynamic disturbance that they may be on intraaortic balloon pump and they may therefore they stand a higher risk of su- surgery um, by way of uh, performing an emergency surgery now type of surgery that's another thing that needs to be considered so cavg versus cavg plus lv aneurysmectomy so we are dealing with the same disease coronary artery disease but in one patient there was an lv aneurysm versus another where there was no aneurysm so the risk of surgery is increased AVR versus mental procedure. So there is a stenosis valve or revascular valve, but there is also ascending aorta that needs to be replaced. So that is likely to carry a higher risk. CABG versus CABG plus valve. Again, this I gave this example earlier. So these are the patients. This is how you should learn to assess the your patients during the period of preoperative period and distinguish them into different groups. You know, so that you can manage them or apply certain protocols that are specific to that category of patients. i think let me admit two more people are waiting here so let me admit them and which means i need to stop sharing and share again <coughs> so so type of surgery should be taken into account now we move on to investigation that's the another major part and uh, um, that needs to be taken into account and uh, every this is a part of our everyday practice we have chest radiograph so many battery of investigations is performed in these patients but how to you know interpret these results and uh, you know, assess the risk in terms of the patient outcome so that's the next part of my presentation so let's look at the chest radiograph this is a schematic representation just to show you the borders so the right heart border is formed by the svc and the right ventricle and the left heart border is formed by the aorta the main pulmonary artery the left atrial appendage and the left ventricle part of the left ventricle so whenever you assess the x ray you need to look at the right and left heart borders as you can see here the right heart border here this is patient with uh, um, uh, mitral regurgitation and uh, you see the kind of cardiomegaly he has and on the right right heart border you can see if you can appreciate the double density that you can see that's the right atrial border and the left atrial border so the left atrial size is very uh, much enlarged then you have the uh, pulmonary artery big pulmonary artery and the left atrial appendage also which is uh, huge in size and the lv also has been enlarged significantly so this patient is a patient with severe uh, mitral regurgitation with severe pulmonary hypertension and is likely to have severe morbidity and mortality other thing i want to point out here is the lateral x ray which we uh, perform in patients who undergo uh, redo surgery and look at the uh, heart that is in proximity with the lower part of the sternum so it is likely to be injured when you perform the sternotomy so you have to take measures maybe take help of the femoral femoral bypass before you do the perform the sternotomy or uh, use a oscillating saw or be ready to transfuse or be ready to institute bypass and be ready to uh, you know uh, administer heparin and uh, uh, you know 
uh, institute the bypass as soon as possible. So this is how the X-ray should be interpreted. And this is one of the X-rays. Uh, this is a relatively recent X-ray, as you can know, notice that this is a digital X-ray. The I want you to look at the left atrial size. This was I think in 2018 or 19 maybe. The size of left atrium in this patient was reported to be 16 centimeters. That is one of the largest left atrium that I have seen. And here you can see the double density of the right heart border. You can see that there is one margin here, right atrium, because he had severe TR also and the left atrial enlargement. So the, the X-ray can provide you valuable information only on, in the extremes of situations. So in two situations, a patient is relatively healthy versus who has got an extreme disease. So these two categories can be very easily uh, evaluated by X-rays. And those who fall intermediate category, they will need further evaluation. You, know, you cannot just uh, evaluate them on the basis of X-ray. Now, this is one more example that I would like to give you of an X-ray of a patient who had uh, who was suffering from atrial septal defect. He was an adult patient. He, he did, uh, did not undergo surgery during the childhood, and he presented during the adulthood. And we found that uh, there is a large, you know, knuckle aortic as well as maybe pulmonary. It is mimicking the aortic knuckle and the pulmonary artery size also. Uh, but we thought that this is an enlarged pulmonary artery, and we were proved to be right. And you see on table the kind of size of the pulmonary artery. It is almost four or five times the size of the aorta. So he had severe pulmonary artery hypertension. So although he was suffering from a disease, ASD, which is considered as very simple disease and very simple operation and uh, residents can do it, that kind of uh, uh, opinion is carried by most of us. But if you are dealing with ASD with this kind of X-ray picture, I do not think that this is a uh, simple category of patient. He is a very severe severely diseased patient and should will have a very high risk of surgical procedure. Now, certain issues related to chamber dilatation. So if you know the pathophysiology, in, in coronary artery disease, you'll see the LV it dilates in all revestant lesions, the LV will dilate in stenotic lesions, so mitral stenosis, the left atrium will dilate, the RV will dilate. So you should have some idea or knowledge about the pathophysiology in order to understand which chambers are dilated in which conditions so that you can interpret the chamber dilatations. And in LV, you need to know the end systolic dimension and end diastolic dimension and LV wall thickness to assess the degree of concentric hypertrophy, which will influence the diastolic function of the LV and the left atrial size, which has now been included as one of the important parameters for assessment of the uh, LV uh, diastolic dysfunction. Although I am not very comfortable, or I don't subscribe too much to the LA size because in uh, transesophageal echo, I am not able to see the entire left atrium most of the times. Uh, the cardiologist may be able to see it in, uh, in transthoracic echocardiography. So although this is included in the ACCH guidelines, I don't find it very useful for me because I don't do much of transthoracic, I do most of the transesophageal echoes. So some of the important dimensions that you should remember. Now remember that these are very important and whenever you are dealing with your patients, please try to look at these diameters and they signify the setting in setting in of the LV dysfunction. So in a patient who is suffering from aortic regurgitation, if the end systolic diameter is more than five centimeters, it means that the LV dysfunction has already set in in this particular patient. So remember that he carries a high risk, be ready to you know, deal with him in a proper manner, get ready with your inotropes and post-op ventilation and certain other things that your uh, local protocols may uh, dictate you to follow in these patients. For patients with mitral regurgitation, remember an end systolic diameter of four centimeters. It used to be 4.5 centimeters. And now it has been reduced to four centimeters. So if the end systolic dimension is more than four centimeters, it means that the LV dysfunction is already second. I already mentioned to you that in mitral regurgitation, the, uh, the ejection fraction overestimates. So ejection fraction less than 60%, and LV and systolic dimension more than four centimeters would mean that this patient is a high risk patient. He should not uh, be dealt with, you know, like a, a normal risk patient. So these are very important cutoff limits and you should remember them. And if, you, if the cardiologist of your institution are not giving you these dimensions, you can request them that these are the dimensions that you need so that you are able to evaluate the risk that this patient is likely to undergo while uh, when, when if he is subjected to this type of surgery. So these are some of the important uh, parameters or values or numbers that you should remember. 
Finally, the assessment of LV function, as I mentioned, the LV ejection fraction, I already mentioned less than 30% is the cutoff limit. And uh, everyone wants to know as to what is the ejection fraction of the patient in order to assess the risk that he is subjected to when you assess the patient. A few words about what kind of, uh, what is uh, various types of fibers that are taken into account for assessing the LV function. As you know, there are longitudinal fibers, circumferential fibers, and the radial fibers. So the longitudinal fibers, they, they you know, decrease the longitudinal length. So the, when the ventricle contracts, the mitral annulus is pulled towards the apex of the left ventricle. So that action is performed by the longitudinal fibers. And mind you that these are subendocardial. So they are the first one to get involved. Then you have circumferential fibers. The ones at the periphery, they you know contract in a clockwise manner, and one at the center, they contract in the anti-clockwise manner. So they produce a ringing effect, and they, they squeeze the myocardium, not squeeze, they ring the myocardium just as you squeeze the clothes, you know, you you know, twist them so that you have a good output. So the myocardium likewise contracts in this manner. So these are the circumferential fibers, and then you have the radial fibers, which lead to radial shortening of the of myocardium. So these are the fibers and uh, the idea of telling you these all these things is to make you understand the current developments in the echocardiographic assessment. As I mentioned, the log longitudinal fibers are some endocardial, so they are the first one to be involved and therefore we have uh, the assessment in terms of the tissue Doppler velocity. So if you do not have the, uh, usually the ejection fraction is uh, performed by eyeballing. So most of the cardiologists will report the ejection fraction by eyeballing and which can be inaccurate as you know, you know, the ejection fraction can be inaccurate even if you are a, or you are an experienced operator. So what I suggest is the systolic velocity on tissue doctor is a very good parameter, little interobserver variability, do not, does not take much time, very quick assessment can be performed and you have got good numbers here. If more than 75, 7.5 centimeter per second is a normal global LV function. If it is less than 5.5, it indicates LV failure. If, and if it is less than three, it indicates that definitely the mortality is going to be high in, in your patients. So these are some of the early markers. I like to uh, uh, you know, classify them as early markers. Although the ejection fraction is 50%, but there could be something called as pre-clinical LV dysfunction. And this can be assessed by the S wave velocity and also by the global longitudinal strain, as you might be knowing that nowadays we have global longitudinal strain. So they, we calculate the longitudinal strain uh, by uh, measuring the, the strain is measured by the uh, length at a given time minus the length uh, at the initial uh, fiber length divided by the L0 uh, or the initial length of the fiber at time zero. And the value is in uh, minus or negative because the LT is the shorter length. So, so when the myocardium contracts, the length is decreased. So therefore you get a negative uh, value uh, in terms of the longitudinal strain. So if the negative, if the longitudinal, global longitudinal strain is more than minus 16, that is uh, minus 18 or minus 20, the LV function is good. And if the global uh, longitudinal strain is less than 16, that is if it is minus 14 or minus 10, then the LV is not functioning well. In spite of the fact that the ejection fraction is good, this is the early marker of the LV dysfunction. <coughs> then there are certain newer developments. Uh, LV pressure strain loop. We, you have heard of LV pressure volume loop. This is a pressure strain loop and you can get some calculator parameters such as LV global work index. So LV global work index can be decreased. So if you have a longitudinal, global longitudinal strain is normal, but the global longitudinal uh, work index is less, uh, then the, the morbidity is likely to be higher versus a patient who has got a normal GLS and uh, a reduced global work index, then the morbidity is likely to be higher. So the global work index is another uh, uh, parameter which is coming up in terms of assessing the LV function and predicting the morbidity and mortality in, in your patients. And these are some of the numbers that the ACCAHA has given. So it de defines uh, the in males and female, females, they are slightly different. So mild, moderate, and severe uh, dysfunction, LV dysfunction based on the ejection fraction and the left atrial volume, these numbers are there. So if you want to uh, assess the uh, patient, these are additional uh, numbers that can help you.
cardiac catheterization very important although nowadays cardiac catheterization is not performed in as uh, as many patients as, as is, it used to be in the earlier days because of the various other non invasive techniques that are available such as echocardiography or uh, cardiac mri or gadolinium uh, mri and some uh, dobutamine stress echo so these are all the uh, non invasive type of investigations that are available but however if the catheterization has been performed please try to find out what was the lv and diastolic pressure if it is more than 16 it indicates diastolic dysfunction also try to find out what is the pulmonary artery pressure because pa pressure pulmonary hypertension is a very important marker of uh, increased morbidity and mortality and in this you would like to know what is the transpulmonary gradient transpulmonary gradient means the uh, me uh, pulmonary artery pressure main pulmonary artery pressure minus the minus the wedge pressure so that gives the transpulmonary gradient if it is less than uh, if it is more than 40 it means that the pulmonary hypertension is of pre capillary type that means the capillaries are getting involved it is not reactive type it will not decrease after surgery and if it is less than 40 it indicates that it is mostly reactive and it will decrease after the surgery and mob uh, and the morbidity and mortality will not be as bad as the one who has got a uh, pre capillary type of pulmonary hypertension response to oxygen is is, uh, is also tested if, if you have pulmonary hypertension if the cardiologist checks that uh, the oxygen response uh, if you administer oxygen the pa pressure decreases it also indicates that the it is a mainly reactive type and not a fixed type of uh, pulmonary hypertension therefore the uh, the outcome may be is likely to be better in these patients so the change in lvdp during injection of a dia so if while the coronary angiography is performed you see that there is a increase in the lvdp it's a good indicator of the uh, inability of the heart to you know deal with the stress situation so if all these uh events can be found out from uh, uh, during L lv angiography or uh, angiography you should try to find them out and use it for predicting the risk assessment now the type of lesion uh, one of the lesions that has been supposed or reported to have uh, as an independent predictor of uh, mid term mortality is the proximal left circumflex artery stenosis so it is not the left main it is the uh, proximal left circumflex artery although there is only one paper and we may have to wait and see whether really the type of lesion is important or the uh, degree or amount of lv that has been damaged is responsible for predicting the outcome in these patients pulmonary hypertension as i mentioned is a very important risk factor and i have defined it as pre capillary where the transpulmonary gradient is more than 40 mm of mercury this is important in patients who suffer from uh, valvular lesions so in at least in our country and even in western world where there there is a mr along with the coronary artery disease so in these patients there is diastolic dysfunction which leads to uh, leads to you know pulmonary hypertension and the transpulmonary gradient if it is more than 48 indicates a bad risk and if it is less than 48 indicates that it is the mostly reactive type of ph uh, and the it will decrease after the mitral valve is replaced now the uh, pulmonary hypertension that is present in patients with aortic stenosis is slightly different because it is because of the increase in the left ventricular end diastolic pressure unlike in mitral valve lesion where it is because of the obstruction or regurgitation of the mitral valve so it is mostly you know reactive type so as soon as the valve is replaced we know that the pa pressure has decreased in many most of the patients in the post operative period unless really the if the patient has been uh, uh, suffering for a long time and it has led to changes in the capillaries uh was so uh, when we are talking of aortic stenosis there is a, a diastolic dysfunction which is the reason for pulmonary hypertension and remember that in patients with aortic stenosis presence or absence of uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension is a major predictor of morbidity and mortality because the pa pressures do not decrease after replacing the aortic valve because it is not because of the obstruction but because of the lv hypertrophy and the lv remodeling does not happen soon after the surgery it takes time to remodel itself so this pa pressure is going to take time to resolve and therefore these patients are likely to suffer from more morbidity and mortality now finally uh, icu admission risk assessment as you know that there could be certain events that may happen during surgical procedure so whatever risk assessment you have performed before the surgery <clears throat> may not hold true uh, at the time of icu admission and these some of the events are you know related to anesthetic for, for instance there is an anaphylactic reaction and the patient had cardiac arrest 
or there was difficulty in intubation and you had spent some time and the patient had hypoxic uh, uh, exposed to hypoxemia then there could be surgical events such as you know the valve had need, needed to be re-replaced re uh, or there was some uh, issue with the myocardial protection, the cardioplegia was not delivered appropriately or perfusion related or any other event which may you know, lead to your reassessment before the patient is admitted to the ICU. So you must perform the assessment of the patient once again when he is admitted to the ICU. These are the two independent predictors of morbidity and mortality, intraoperative predictors that have been defined by the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. Use of intraortic balloon pump for separation from CPB and CPB time more than six to 160 uh, minute has been identified as an independent predictor of morbidity and mortality. So I have spent a lot of time in explaining uh, nearly one hour and 15 minutes explaining the risk assessment, but uh, as you know, this was meant for the postgraduates and I think Still, I might have left a few things and which may come, you know, become uh, obvious during discussion period. So, I would like to conclude that assessment of cardiac risk should be a part of preoperative evaluation. You know, all of us must do it diligently, religiously, and, you know, make an estimate or prediction of what is the likely outcome in this patient in terms of morbidity and mortality. And this is how the learning can be improved by performing it every day. And this should be performed by an anesthesiologist. Most of the anesthesiologists do not do this. I think we should start doing this in more detail. We do perform an assessment only in terms of our anesthesia-related risk assessment. We examine the airway, we examine the, whether there is cardiac failure or not, whether he is likely to be ventilated in the post-operative period and things like that. So we are more interested in assessing those kind of risks, but don't hesitate to you know, make an overall assessment of the risk. The wish can institute measures to minimize the risk uh, uh, if we uh, you know, assess some of the risk uh, factors which are modifiable and this should be definitely performed during the perioperative period. And this is likely to improve the outcome uh, in these patients. So thank you very much for uh, your attention. And uh, as usual, this is my email ID and uh, my phone number. So those of you who are not able to understand or want to know, clarify certain issues, please feel free to either email me or WhatsApp me your messages and I will be very happy to respond if we are not able to answer them during this presentation. So Dr. Rahul, I am done with my presentation and I think uh, Dr. Deshpande is there, one of the PGs who is uh, going to make her presentation and I am supposed to moderate her. Dr. Rahul? Sir, please make her the motion. Sir, he got disconnected. Okay, so Dr. Rahul is disconnected? Okay, Dr. Rahul is disconnected. Yeah, yes, sir. Okay, so never mind. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gargi Deshpande uh, is there on the Gargi line? Gargi Deshpande is there on the line? Yes, sir. Gargi, can you hear me? Can you allow her to share her screen, Manoj? Is sir, Gargi there? Sir, sir you, have to, you have to make her host. You have to make her host. How do I make her host? So actually, she got disconnected. You have to allow her, allow her and uh, right click and I can and make her host. At, at the uh, moment, there is nobody waiting in the waiting room. How can I, I make you the host? Yes, sir, please, please. How can I do that? So just right click on the ICC office button on the right side and make, make me host. ICC office and uh, make you the make host. Okay, so I have made you the host yeah. and you can allow okay. Gargi to... Uh, in the meantime, if there are any questions in the chat box, is anybody going to moderate this or let me have a look at the chat box if there are any questions. I will also stop sharing. So if there, if there, is, if there is anything in the chat box, let me look at... Uh, uh, from Saji to everyone. Multi <laughs> it's not a question. Uh, SK is saying excellent talk. So if, please feel free to write your questions. Still, we are trying to uh, get Kargi on the line. In the meantime, Manoj, can you please get Kargi on the line? Yes, sir. Yes.
Hello? Yeah, yeah, actually you are, you are the host now. Vargi is the host now. So where are we? Manoj, where are we? Are we able to get? Oh, yeah, Doctor Gagi, please start. Yeah, yeah, sir. Yeah. Okay. Doctor Gagi, please. Uh, Doctor Gagi, can you just uh, please uh, you know introduce yourself and then start your presentation because uh, many of us would not know you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm sorry. There was some technical issue at my problem. Uh, I am Dr. Gargi Deshpande. I have joined as a fellow in IACTA at Hinduja Hospital, Mumbai, this week. So uh, today we'll be uh, talking about preoperative optimization of patients posted for cardiac surgery. Uh, sir, are you able to see my slides? Not yet. Manoj, can you help her? Manoj, have you made uh, the uh, host? I am not able to share my slides, sir. Okay. Right okay. now. Uh, yes, sir. sir. Uh, are you able to see my slides now, sir? Yes, we can see now. Okay, so uh, today we'll be speaking about preoperative optimization of patients which are posted to cardiac surgery. Uh, the preoperative assessment of patients for cardiac surgery is. Can very... you make a slideshow, Gargi? Sorry, can you go to slideshow mode? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm already in slideshow, sir. Okay, but I, my screen doesn't show slideshow. Anyway, we'll go on. Gargi, you're not in slideshow mode. You uh, press that wine glass uh, at the bottom. Uh, yes. Sir, I've already pressed it. Do it again. On your screen, is it slideshow? Yes, sir. It is slideshow on my screen. No. Okay. Anyway, let's let's go on. Um. Okay, sir. So the preoperative opt. Uh, sir, can you see my slides right now? Yes, we can. No, not we can't see your slides now. What have you done? You stop share screen. That is why it has happened. No, so I have um, restarted it again. Yeah. So Gargi is only a recently joined resident. So uh, thank you, Dr. Gargi, for you know uh, being a part of this presentation and uh, taking a lead. Remember all the post graduates. She has been in the hospital only for last week or so, and she agreed to make this presentation. So you know. Great. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. I'm, I'm actually trying to fix this technical issue. I'm really very sorry, sir. I don't know there's something wrong with this. You're okay. You move your slide now. I can see your slides. Yes, sir. But I'm changing my slides and this, it's not. Yes, sir. Okay, fine. Your slide has changed now. Then again, came back to the first slide. Yes, I'm trying. I'm on it, Sam. Maybe I uh, now. Now it's on the second slide. Okay. Uh, so, sir, preoperative. Can you yes, close your left side left side box? It says close. That close that. Yeah. Yes. Sir. Now you go on the uh, slide show again and see if it happens. No, sir. Okay, it's fine. Not yeah, this is fine. Now you move. Okay. Sir. Uh, 
so the preoperative assessment of patients that are posted for cardiac surgeries carries a lot of significance because it helps in the optimization prior to surgery and that can help reducing the perioperative morbidity and mortality. Now, the factors that are important in determining perioperative morbidity and anesthetic management must be assessed carefully for every patient. So before going on to the factors, we'll first speak about some multifactorial risk indices, which uh, Tempesa has already discussed. Uh, so the first one is the revised cardiac risk index, which includes total six factors. And uh, one is the history of IHD, history of congestive cardiac failure, history of cerebrovascular disease or transient ischemic attack, pre-treatment with insulin for diabetes mellitus, pre-operative serum creatinine of more than 2 mg per deciliters, and high-risk surgery. So every factor carries one point, and depending upon the increase in the points, the risk of mortality and the risk of cardiac complications increases. The second one is a cardiac risk calculator. This is available online at www.surgicalriskcalculator.com. So it's an app-based or online proforma, which is related to the patient details that can be filled to obtain a precise perioperative cardiac risk. So it is kind of this format. It in, we have to fill the details of the patient, the age group, the gender, the functional status, the emergency case, ASA status, and so on. And then we finally, uh, according to the points, we grade the severity of the cardiac complications associated. Uh, the third one is a Euroscore, which is European System for Cardiac Risk Evaluation. Uh, that also, uh, we have to fill some uh, points, for example, age, gender, renal impairment, extra cardiac arteriopathy, and it predicts the risk of in-hospital mortality after major cardiac surgery. Risk category is low for 0 to 2, moderate 3 to 5, and high is more than 6. Uh, Duke Activity Status Index, sir, has already spoken about it. It's a self-reported questionnaire. It consists of 12 questionnaires, which we ask the patients, can you take care of yourself? Can you walk indoors and so on? And then if the score is 34 or lower, that indicates that the patients are at a risk of myocardial injury, myocardial infarction, moderate to severe complications, and new disability. Payment et al. in 1983 identified eight simple clinical risk factors, poor LV function, congestive heart failure, unstable angina or MI within the last six months, age more than 65 years, severe obesity, re-operation, emergency surgery, and severe or uncontrolled systemic illness. And NYHA classification we have already discussed about. Uh, so uh, these are the multifactorial risk indices which we take into consideration. It definitely gives a lot of importance as compared to assessing only a single factor. Uh, so now for preoperative optimization, we will first discuss three case scenarios and individually we'll discuss, we'll talk about the optimization of each of these patients. Now the first case scenario is a 68 year old male that presented with exert dyspnea on exertion since, since last eight months, chest pain on exertions, uh, which is relieved by rest since last two months, no history of cuff, no history of orthopnea, PND, syncope or palpitation, case of diabetes and hypertension on OHAs and tablet amlodipine and enalapril. Weight is 78 kg, height 168 centimeters, pulse rate is regular, BP 140 by 62, JVP is not elevated, no clubbing, cyanosis, pala, ricterus, or edema. Uh, CVS, RS, CNS, abdominal systemic examination is within normal limit, all blood investigations are normal, chest x ray is normal, ECG shows Q waves in V1 to V5 with T wave inversion. Uh, echocardiogram shows concentric LVH, mild hypokinesia of mid and distal anterior wall and anterior lateral wall. Ejection fraction is 55%. And coronary angiography that was done shows 90% blockade in the left anterior descending artery, 80% blockade in the first diagonal artery, and 75% in the obtuse marginal. So the plan of surgery is an elective CABG. Now this patient has come to us for preoperative optimization. Now the first factor is age. As we have discussed, it's an unmodifiable factor, but we have to keep it in mind that the response of the elderly heart to stress, catecholamine stimulation is depressed. Also, the overall, phys overall physiological status of the elderly population may be also depressed because of associated medical conditions. So these factors have to be taken into consideration prior to taking up an elderly patient into the operation theater. The second is functional status of the patient, because as it is an elective CABG, we have ample amount of time to assess the functional status of the patient, which is a most important predictor of the risk of cardiac mortality. So the patient's functional status can be a useful... Dr. Gargi, can you just hold on? Can you go back to the previous slide? Yes, sir. And one more, one more. Yes. So if you see this 68-year-old male, uh, that means he's, as per the WHO definition, it is not elderly, it is young old. Yes, so depends on what, what is his physical status and other uh, capacity that you need to take into account. But I would like to draw your attention to the complaints. So Disney on exertion. What is the degree of uh, uh, exertion that he is carrying out? You know, that you should try to find, find out. What are the symptoms of a patient with uh, coronary artery disease? 
so patient will have chest pain patient will chest have pain. Uh, yes sir is it is is dyspnea a common symptom in coronary artery disease no sir it's not a common symptom no isn't it so breathlessness is a, is a feature when will it appear in a patient with coronary artery disease when will the uh, breathlessness appear so when there will be an underlying lv dysfunction um yes. and when, leading to leading to um, poor ejection fraction and, uh, leading to pulmonary so, congestion yes so pulmonary congestion will be produced on two occasions one is either there is systolic dysfunction or there is diastolic dysfunction and this patient who is suffering from coronary artery disease is you know liable to suffer from both so this symptom has told you that this patient has does not have just the coronary artery disease but he has got some damage to the lv which is resulting yes. into you know uh, leading to breathlessness and if you had quantified the degree of exercise that would have help you even more for example yes. if he could walk only 20 steps or he cannot climb one flight of stairs that would have added more information to the uh, the kind of lv function yes. assessment based purely on the symptoms okay yes, so if sir. you know the pathophysiology you can you know correlate your presence or absence of symptoms to the pathophysiology here we are trying to relate the symptom of dyspnea to the lv dysfunction at this stage we do not know whether this is systolic dysfunction or diastolic dysfunction but we know that there is lv dysfunction the further investigations would clarify that okay yes sir now yes, sir. the other <clears throat> orthopnea and other things are not there and diabetes is okay uh but if you look at the uh, chest x ray so there yes. is cardiomegaly isn't it uh what is yes, the ratio sir. like so ct ratio is 0.5 0.5 so just borderline isn't it Point. so there is not much of lv dilatation on the basis of x ray but you can see that on the ecg there is there are some q waves you know so our your assessment that you made here that there is you know uh, lv uh, dysfunction is present based on the symptoms your ecg is, is suggestive yes that there there is some uh, uh, you know q waves are there and also wall motion abnormalities are there so the lv has suffered isn't it so my uh, the idea of you know getting you back to this slide was just to explain you how you know the presenting symptoms and each and every parameter should be correlated in terms of the severity of the disease have you understood yes sir yes i have understood okay. unfortunately yes. there are uh, i think what we should do dr rahul and others so next time onwards there should let there be one presenter and let there be three or four other uh, final year students so that if uh, the presenter is not able to answer then the questions can be thrown to the other three or four students who are there and they, they could, it could make it a more interactive session uh, with the students moderator interacting with the students here i have only one student uh with me and i can only talk to her and uh, she is also very young and junior and she is not exposed to cardiac anesthesia as much as uh, one would have liked to but nevertheless that the very fact that she has agreed to participate and has is participating is you know is a really very commendable so now we can go on to the next slide that you were uh, showing yes so yes. age is a factor next yes uh so the second factor is a functional status of the patient so as it is an elective case we have time to assess the functional status of the patient uh so the patient's functional status can be an useful marker for cardiovascular risk and help determine the necessity for preoperative cardiac stress testing in major non cardiac surgeries gerish and colleagues found that the inability to climb two flights of uh, stairs showed a positive predictive value of 82% for post operative pulmonary and cardiac complications now functional capacity is expressed as metabolic equivalent of task where one met is equivalent to the oxygen consumption of 3.5 ml per kg per minute in a 40 year old 70 kg man and then we grade according to the mets performed less than 4 is poor functional capacity 4 to 6 is moderate 7 to 10 is good functional capacity and more than 10 is excellent functional capacity so what is the functional capacity of this patient Uh, uh sir it will be uh somewhere in between so 4 to 6 minutes because sir he is uh, the dyspnea that the patient is having it's nyha grade 2 that means that there is a slight limitation of physical activity so right. sir maybe yes, yes but you should have actually given some more i know that this is a uh, scenario that you have created but what one would like to know as to what level of activity you know leads to this these symptoms so by saying that he was nyha2 
it indicates that yes, he has a, he had a reasonable functional capacity, maybe around five or six or maybe seven, depending upon uh, if you would have liked to, if, if, if you could have found out the exact uh, degree of activity that he was performing, we could have been more sure. So anyway, so functional capacity uh, is an important parameter in this patient. So by that parameter also, he is falling into somewhere around moderate category. Okay, go on. Yes. Uh, so those patients who have limited functional capacity, we subject them to stress testing. Stress testing can be either exercise stress testing or pharmacological stress testing. Exercise stress testing involves a graded physical exercise and the associated signs and symptoms of ischemia, arrhythmias, and LV dysfunction are noted. Exercise causes increased oxygen demand, which is met by an increase in the coronary blood flow by vasodilatation. Any impairment in this vascular reserve due to coronary obstruction or vasospasm can lead to myocardial ischemia and sequelae. The principal indicator of ischemia during exercise and immediate recovery period is ST segment deviation. Pharmacological stress testing with dobutamine stress echo can be performed in patients who are not able to exercise. The coronary flow reserve is tested by increasing the heart rate by dobutamine infusion. And the normal test report is either absence of new or a worsening of regional valve motion abnormality. Stress testing. So, so do you know, do you know how the exercise stress test is performed? Are you aware of some of the protocols? Yes, sir. There are the most commonly used protocol is a Bruce protocol. Other protocols yes. are Raffield protocols as well. So in Bruce protocol, uh, so we subject the patient. Uh, there are three three minutes stages uh, exercises, and um, uh, initially yes. it is started. So the patient is asked to walk on a treadmill. Uh, so we begin with one point seven miles per hour speed for the first three minutes, and for the next three minutes, for the success successive uh, sessions, we keep increasing the speed, and um, we the exercise the test is when uh, the maximum either the maximum heart rate is achieved or the patient um, develops any uh, symptoms signs suggestive of um, myocardial ischemia or the patient complains of chest pain so when do you say that the test is positive uh, so sir we uh, the we basically uh, desire to achieve the 85% of the target heart rate of the patient, sir. So if that 85% of target heart rate is not achieved, uh, and before that only if the patient starts developing STT changes, then that indicates that the patient, uh, well, he's tested positive for ischemia. Yes. And uh, what is the sensitivity and specificity of this test? Do you know? Um, I'm sorry, sir. I don't know the exact values. Well, now here we are, I would have liked to have some uh, students, you know, the other students where you know the questions can be thrown to these students. So it is not very specific. It has some uh, failure rate about in about 10 to 15 percent of the patients so uh, that the stress test may be negative, but the patient may be having coronary artery disease. Uh, what particular information during a stress test would be of use to an anesthesiologist? Uh, so the ischemic threshold or the rate pressure product of the um, patient, because the ischemic threshold indicates that the heart rate at which the signs of ischemia has developed, uh, so that will give us an idea of uh, um, the, the hemodynamic stability that we should maintain during the perioperative care. Yes, so, so, the so if the ST changes have started occurring at a heart rate of 120, you know that in your patient, when you anesthetize this patient, you should take measures so that this heart rate doesn't go to that level because that is the cutoff limit at which uh, ischemia is induced in this patient. Okay, so if the stress test report is available as an anesthesiologist, it is this information that you should try to look for. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Go on. Yes, sir. so uh, the first point that we talked was age. The second was uh, the functional capacity. Now, the third is myocardial ischemia itself. Uh, so this patient has come for elective CABG. He's a case of myocardial ischemia. Uh, so in patients with coronary artery disease, the most important predictive risk factors are the amount of myocardium that is at risk, the ischemia threshold, the heart rate at which the ischemia occurs, the stability of symptoms, because if the symptoms worsen, that indicates that there is an embolization or rupture of the plaque. And last is the adequacy of medical therapy. So these five points we have to take into consideration when we get a patient of MI. Now, what is stable ischemic heart disease? It is also known as a chronic no, stable. How would you take into, let us go back to these five points that you mentioned. Can you elaborate as to how exactly you would you know, put to use in your clinical practice? Uh, so the um, first point is the amount of myocardium at risk. That means that um, how much area uh, in what walls of the left ventricle do we have hypokinesia or kinesia or dyskinesia. Uh, the second is the ischemic threshold as uh, uh, we, we discussed, sir, that the heart rate or the rate pressure uh, product that is a systolic yes. BP. 
multiplied by the heart rate that gives the rate pressure of product yes. uh, the stability of symptoms which indicates that if there is a worsening that means there could be an embolization or rupture of a plug that could indicate that uh, the patient could be worsened uh, if there is a hemodynamic instability intraoperatively and last is the adequacy of medical therapy that whatever antiplatelets or anti ischemic therapy we are giving um, is the patient responding well to that therapy or not so the stability of symptoms is you are indicating towards unstable angina is that so uh yes sir how can yes. you how can you is there any medicine which will and you also mentioned that this is because of plaque rupture so any any medicine that can stabilize the plaque uh sir any antiplatelet drugs or anticoagulants oh, antiplatelets prevent uh, coagulation so stabilization of plaque yes. membrane stabilizing action not membrane stabilizing maybe uh, not a correct word but uh, the pleiotropic effect as described correctly the correct word would be pleiotropic effect any medicine that you know of statins statins yes. statins statins yes. okay all the statins are known to you know stabilize the plaque so yes, they many times the patients uh, symptoms they improve once the antiplatelet and statins are started especially in elderly patients in whom uh, surgery or uh, inter uh, percutaneous intervention is not indicated those patients will receive statins and antiplatelet agents and nitrates and you find that they improve symptomatically because their plaque stabilizes and they you know become symptom free so yes, this is one of the measures that can be taken in these patients so that's a valuable information in terms of the stability of the symptoms and the adequacy of medical therapy okay you were talking about stable ischemic heart disease let us understand that uh so stable ischemic heart disease is also known as chronic stable angina most often results from obstruction to coronary arterial blood flow by a fixed atherosclerotic coronary lesion in one of the large epicardial arteries uh and how do we medically manage it we give aspirin at 75 to 120 62 mg daily beta adrenergic blockers calcium channel antagonist on nitrates as a second line therapy or as a first line therapy when beta blockers are contraindicated uh ace inhibitors in patients where ejection fraction is less than 40% or where the patient has diabetes hypertension or chronic renal failure lipid management uh lifestyle management dietary changes or statins bp control smoking cessation diabetes control and weight loss so th these are the various interventions that you are talking about and we as a cardiac anesthesiologists are fortunate because most of these patients will already be on these medicines and will be stabilized by the by the cardiologist uh, or the cardiac surgeons before the patient is uh, you know scheduled for surgery however sometimes it may not be so especially in the urgent types of situations uh, or uh, emergency where you can refer the patient back to the cardiologist asking him or suggesting to him that the patient is still unstable he gets some ectopics or he is having uh, some symptoms uh, of unstable angina is it possible to you know formalize the therapy so that he this can be uh, controlled so otherwise uh, uh, we as cardiac anesthesiologists do not have much role except for the diabetes control which may be you know at times you know this patient so what uh, we we like to do is to move them to the intensive care unit instead of keeping them in the ward admit them in the post operative ward or some area where uh, you can start the uh, insulin infusion and then control the sugar level and uh, next day you can operate them instead of uh, waiting for the sugar levels to stabilize on the, the Uh, oral therapy or the insulin that is being administered on sliding scale basis you may start the infusion of this patient so beyond that uh, i do not see much role uh, of a cardiac anesthesiologist in the medical management have you understood that we we have to rely mostly on the cardiologist and cardiac surgeons for these issues yes, and most of the times we are fortunate that most of the times they are well controlled but if not we can certainly you know look into these and suggest that maybe a statin would you like to start statin or or uh, discontinue ecosprin sometimes they are they are on ecosprin and antiplatelet agents because some of the lesions if you discontinue uh, the antiplatelet agents and ecosprin the patient start getting symptomatic so uh, you know we, we may talk to the cardiologist is it possible to discontinue them for uh, maybe 24 hours or 48 hours at least and if they disagree then you, that becomes a different risk 
parameter for the patient. So you'll have to tell the patient that because we cannot discontinue your medicines, you stand at a higher risk of uh, bleeding in these patients. You will, and as an anesthesiologist, you will take extra measures to be ready to deal with uh, excessive bleeding in these patients. Okay, which could be yes. a variety of those, which is not a, not a part of discussion uh, for today. Okay. Yes, right. sir. Uh, the fourth uh, factor. Is uh, if anybody else uh, from uh, amongst the panelists, uh, Dr. Koshi, Dr. Mukul, or Dr. Nima, if they want to contribute something, please feel free to contribute because it is only going to strengthen this uh, discussion and will be useful for the students. Okay. Uh, so the next factor is hypertension. Uh, okay. the, the contribution of hypertension to perioperative mortality and morbidity depends upon the resting and the uh, blood pressure level associated with stress, the etiology of hypertension, the pre-existing complications of hypertension and physiological changes due to drug therapy. So patients with untreated, poorly treated or labile preoperative hypertension are more likely to suffer perioperative BP liability, dysrhythmias or myocardial ischemia and transient neurological complications as well. And uh, the another factor is diabetes. And especially if it is associated with autonomic neuropathy is associated with silent ischemia. The infarct size and mortality is also reported to be higher in diabetes. Therefore, it should be considered as a potential risk factor for perioperative cardiac morbidity. Nevertheless, control of blood sugars with diet control and medical therapy should be strictly followed perioperatively. Also, diabetes, tight sugar of blood control is important in order to prevent any perioperative infections. Uh, so where, now, where is your patient now? Now let's go back to your patient. Try to and not don't go back in terms of slides, but uh, uh, explain where is this patient fitting based on the various issues that we have discussed so far. We discussed the uh, functional capacity, age, and NYHA grade, and the uh, uh, functional capacity and Q waves and other things. What about these issue, other issues that you have just informed us? Where where is yes, your sir. patient? So one thing is hypertensive. The patient is hypertensive as well as he is diabetic. Uh, wow. So he's been diabetic for the last eight years um, on tablet glycomate 500 mg BD. Uh, so, so if it is a well-controlled diabetes, uh, uh, th then it's a good thing, sir. If it is not controlled, then it has to be, insulin can be added or the oral uh, hypoglycemic agents can be further modified in order to uh, have a good control of blood sugar perioperatively. And the patient is hypertensive for the last five years and he is on amlodipine and enalapril. Enalapril is an ACE, inhib uh, ACE inhibitor. So uh, it can have, uh, uh, so monitoring of serum electrolytes is also important and the renal function test is important in this patient. So we would like to know more about his diabetes as to uh, how well controlled it is or not. And regarding the uh, hypertension, as I mentioned, you know, hypertension per se is not a risk factor, but the uh, target organs involvement is the risk factor. So in this patient, what are the kidney functions would become relevant? And also if he has any history of stroke or minor stroke or any neurological impairment, because the basic pathophysiology in these patients is the atherosclerosis. And atherosclerosis uh, leads to hypertension and uh, uncontrolled blood pressure leads to atheroma dislodgements and other things leading to uh, kidney dysfunction and also the neurological dysfunction. So in this patient, because he is hypertensive and diabetes, you would like to know further what are his kidney functions like, how well, con how con uh, nicely controlled the diabetes is or not. And also you would like to know about if the neurological status is all right. Is there any history of syncope or any history of uh, a stroke in this patient that also you would like to know, which is not existent in this patient, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, what else did you mention in the... Uh, uh, some medical management of uh, ischemic heart yes. disease. Yes. So what is he on, this patient? Do you know? Uh, what no, no, sir. He is only on... No, it's a, it's a virtual scenario that you have created. So what we have already discussed that, you know, the, uh, the importance of statins or importance of uh, diabetes therapy or importance of continuation or discontinuation of the antiplatelet agents and the uh, eco sprain that we have discussed. Okay, go on now. Um, now, if um, the patient is coming for an elective procedure, the patient could be on some preoperative medications. Now, one thing is antihypertensives. Now, all antihypertensives should be continued perioperatively because the risk of rebound hypertension is high, except for ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, which pose a risk of precipitous hypertension. And hence, the morning dose of ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blockers should be withheld on the day of surgery. 
Continuation of perioperative beta blockers is necessary to prevent rebound phenomena as abrupt withdrawal of beta adrenergic blockers leads to nervousness, palpitations, tachycardia, hypertension, and even MI or ventricular arrhythmias. So why, why, why ACE inhibitors are to be discontinued? Can you define what is the reason? Uh, sir, because they cause a significant hypotension if we take the uh, dose on the morning of surgery and it is resistant to um, the sympathomimetic agents also. The hypotension which is caused, it is resistant to sympathomimetic agents also. So, so sir, to what agent do they respond? Uh, so, uh, the, theoretically, sir, they respond to vasopressin. Theoretically? Uh, not so practically? They, sir, they, they do respond to vasopressin. They do respond to yes. vasopressin. Is vasopressin readily available in cardiac operating room? Mm, no, sir. Uh, sir, it, it can yeah, not. Usually be not. Normal. It may be, it may not be. Usually, it's not a medicine which is so readily available as it would be in a liver ICU because uh, terlipressin, vasopressin, and norepinephrine, these are the medicines that they use very commonly so but in, in a uh, cardiac operating room uh, maybe we, we use vaso, vasopressin for treating vasoplegia which by itself is a uh, relatively rare phenomenon in uh, in the cardiac surgical patients but we do look for this uh, uh, this kind of medicines uh, if we have face uh, uh, intractable hypotension so the ace inhibitors see all the, the anesthetic agents that we use they lead to hypotension but we don't discontinue them we don't stop using them thiopentone propofol uh, spinal block epidural block they all lead to hypotension but we know how to treat them effectively but the hypotension produced by ace inhibitors may not be so easily treatable it may be refractory and it may be harmful that is why most of the people they try to want to omit the morning dose some people omit it for one or two days, which is not really desirable because then it leads to hypertension, problems of hypertension. You see, one medicine you have started for treatment of hypertension. Now, if you discontinue it, then the hypertension will precipitate. So, a medicine which was started for a particular use should not be discontinued unless it is, you know, if the hypertension is well controlled, only then it, you are allowed to do so. So, ACE inhibitors, because they lead to intractable hyp hypotension, Therefore, the morning dose should be withdrawn and the post-operative dose should be started as soon as possible so that yes. the patient does not suffer from hypertension because you know that hypertension is also not desirable in the post-operative period. There could be bleeding problems, there could be atheromas getting dislodged from the carotid vessels or renal vessels and something like that. So even hypertension is not desirable even in the post-operative period. So you should discontinue ACE inhibitors uh, morning dose. That is the practice which is followed in most centers and you restart it but do not forget to restart it as soon as it is possible there's one more controversy related to ACE inhibitors do you know what is that ACE inhibitors and receptor antagonist or receptor blockers are you aware of any other controversy so, so uh, they are indicated in renal dysfunction but uh, uh, contraindicated in patients with bilateral renal artery stenosis Yes, they are, they are given in renal dysfunction. You mentioned something which is very important. All the cardiologists will administer ACE inhibitors and receptor blockers in order to contain the renal dysfunction in this patient. Long-term renal, uh, renal function is uh, or renal outcome is preserved or better in patients who are on uh, ACE inhibitors or receptor blockers. But some people believe that you know it leads to acute uh, kidney dysfunction during uh, post-operative period. Because it does happen, because the GFR is decreased, because what happens is the, uh, the afferent uh, arteriole is also vasodilated. Efferent as well as afferent arteriole is uh, vasodilated by receptor antagonists and ACE inhibitors. So that the GFR is decreased and because GFR is decreased, there is creatinine increases. But the moment you improve the GFR by discontinuing these medicines, you get the improvement in the creatinine thereby trying to suggest that the culprit is the ACE inhibitor, which in fact is not because the, the kidney injury means injury to the tubules. And if you dilate the afferent arterioles, the tubular damage is prevented. That is why the, all these patients are on ACE inhibitors. So the uh, discontinuation of ACE inhibitors with the objective of improving the kidney function is rather not correct, not totally correct because the kidney dis dysfunction manifestation is pre-renal in nature because of the decrease in the GFR. Uh, therefore, there is a bit of controversy in terms of uh, the usage of ACE inhibitors uh, during the perioperative period. But in any case, 
most of the people in most of the centers, the morning dose is omitted and the, it is restarted as soon as possible in the post-operative period with the view to you know control the blood pressure. Okay. So yes. the renal controversy is there, but I do not think that it actually leads to renal dysfunction. Use of uh, ACE inhibitors that does not lead to tubular damage. Okay. Okay. So in this patient, what medicines is he getting? So he is on amlodipine and enalapril. So, okay. so the, I would like to continue amlodipine in the morning of surgery, but would like to omit enalapril in the morning. Okay. So about, what about beta blockers? Why is he not on beta blockers? They are such a good medicine for you know patients with coronary artery disease. Yes, sir. You, you are also, your slide also mentions continuation of perioperative beta blockers is necessary to prevent rebound phenomenon, isn't it? Yes, and sir. So and abrupt. So abrupt withdrawal is definitely not indicated. The patients who are on beta blockers, presently the ACCHA recommendations regarding beta blockers are mainly for patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. And they have been significantly diluted. As you may be knowing that earlier, there was a very strong recommendation of or continuation of beta blockers in patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. And this was based on one paper, one paper which was by the older man. Uh, I think it decreased trial uh, by the name of decreased trial, older man's paper, which demonstrated that the in patients who uh, whose myocardium is vulnerable to ischemia, uh, in them, if you discontinue beta blockers, then the mortality is increased by about 32 times, something around uh, around 30 times. And this paper was the basis for this very strong recommendation in patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. But later on, it was found that this paper was a, a scientific fraud and it was withdrawn. And the, therefore, the, uh, the recommendation has been diluted significantly. Also, subsequently, you might have heard of POIS trial, which confused yes, the issue. Uh, yes, it, it suggested that there is increase in the cerebral mm -hmm. uh, morbidity and mortality number of strokes that are increased. There was further confusion created by the POIS trial, although the dosage used in the POIS trial were very high. Uh, but therefore, due to these reasons, the current recommendation for non-cardiac surgery, we are not talking of cardiac surgery, for non-cardiac surgery, the continuation of beta blockers doesn't carry a strong indication. There's a lot of flexibility. It gives a lot of, permits a lot of individualization. So the, if the risk of myocardial ischemia is there, uh, and the type of surgery performed is likely to increase the risk of myocardial ischemia, only then the beta blocker should be administered. That kind of recommendation is there. But for patients undergoing cardiac surgery, patients suffering from uh, coronary artery disease are most of them, 90% of the patients will be on beta blockers and you should continue to administer beta blockers to them. Okay? Yes, sir. Right. Uh, the second is statins. And they are also continued perioperatively because they reduce the concentration of low-density lipoproteins. They have shown to slow coronary artery plaque formation, increase the plaque stability, anti-proliferative and leukocyte adhesion limiting defects are also there. And last one, if the patient is on anti-dysrhythmics, anti-arrhythmics, they should be also continued perioperatively. Which uh, anti-arrhythmics are you talking about? Uh, sir, rate control or rhythm control. Uh, uh, usually, uh, anti-arrhythmics are not... Uh not administered except for beta blockers. You know, usually, the yes, sir. Sir. cardiologists do not like to treat arrhythmias by medicines. They like to ablate the, the arrhythmias. So if there is atrial fibrillation, they would like to do radio frequency ablation. If there is ventricular tachycardia, they would like to ablate the accessory pathway by radio frequency ablation and so on. So I, actually, antiarrhythmics, uh, uh, I don't know, you must have taken it from some book and uh, therefore you are writing it anti-dysrhythmics. But they should be continued. I agree with that. And uh, statins we have already discussed. So uh, let us apply this to our patient, you know, whatever case you have uh, mentioned. The, yes, does sir. your patient have uh, unstable angina? Uh, no, sir. He doesn't. No. Have. So we don't need to have statins strictly. But if he had some unsta uh, unstable angina, then statins would be a very good option in these patients because they improve the uh, morbidity and mortality in the patients undergoing CAVG. Okay, next. Uh, 
So, so now we go to the next. So what can you summarize the case scenario number one? Just try to assess the risk in terms of risk only. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. So this patient was a 68 year old male who was posted for elective CABG with comorbidities of hypertension and diabetes with exercise tolerance NYHA grade two. So no, no, no. Uh, just define what are the risk factors in this patient. Can you in, highlight the risk in, factors? Yes, sir. So in this patient, the functional capacity of the patient one. Uh, the uh -huh. second is hypertension and third is uh, uh, diabetes and fourth is uh, the con um, ongoing medications and the continuation of the perioperative medications in this patient. And the age is 68, uh, age. slightly not yes. as good as a 50 year old man or a 55 yes. year old man. So these are the risk factors which appear to be fairly well controlled. So uh, a mild to mild kind of uh, risk one would like to place him in a milder risk category. Uh, not a moderate, not even moderate or severe risk. If you, you should have tried to put this uh, parameters in the uh, NSQIP parameters or uh, European Euroscore. Yes, sir. Pharma, we would have known the exact figures. Exact risk. Did you try to do it? Um, yes, sir, no. I tried to do it. No, sir, I did try. So what I, difficulties did you encounter in doing so? Uh, so no, there are several other factors, sir, which I did not, but the values could of not fill up. Huh. Uh, but if you keep those factors blank, what happens to the scoring? Does it say that these are mandatory factors or the parameters? Um, so you don't have an idea. Sir. No. Okay. So you keep on trying this. You know, when you go back, you can try and see, uh, make a hypothetical situation, scenario, case scenario, and see what is the risk. And then just change one of the parameters. For example, is there any history of previous myocardial infarction? Right? No. And see what is the risk. And then during the next uh, uh, time you make it yes, I keep all other parameters similar and see what happens to the uh, increase in the risk. It will be a good exercise for all the postgraduates, isn't it? Yes, sir. Do you agree or not? Yes, I do agree. Okay, so you can make uh, age as 50 and the next patient make an age of 80 years, keeping all other parameters same and see how it influences the risk factors you will get some idea about uh, how much risk is increased by merely increasing the age or presence or absence of uh, congestive cardiac failure or presence or absence of uh, neurological stroke. So that exercise, I think all the uh, PGs who are listening should uh, do after they go back home or maybe tomorrow. Okay. Yes. Sir. Okay. So the second scenario, how many scenarios do you have? The three scenarios. Three scenarios. So it is quarter past six and we were given a time of three hours. So we are all right. We can go, go ahead with uh, two more scenarios. Yes. Uh, so the second one is a 58 year old male presented with breathlessness on and off since eight months and YHA grading two to three progressive in nature. He had chest pain at rest and post prandial also with STD changes in almost all leads. He was admitted in emergency, taken up for emergency angiography and SOS angioplasty. Angiography showed 95% block in a left main coronary artery, 90% block in the left anterior descending artery, 80% in first diagonal, 70% in second obtuse marginal, and 100% in right coronary artery. Intraiotic balloon pump was inserted in catheterization lab as HCT changes were still persistent despite heparin and NTG infusion. Uh, comorbidities, he has history of diabetes for last eight years on regular OHA. He's been hypertensive for the last five years on tablet amlodipine and enalapril and glycomet. Weight is 70, height is 165, pulse rate is regular, BP is 140 by 62, JVP is slightly elevated, no cyanosis, clubbing, pallor, icterus, edema, CVS, RS, CNS, abdo, systemic examination is normal. All blood investigations. Okay, are stay on the stay on the same slide. Okay, so by looking at this slide only, I don't think I need any more information. It appears to me that he carries a very severe risk, except for his age, which is less than sixty-five years. I think he has got all the parameters which suggest that he is a poor risk. Breathlessness on and off since last eight months. So he has been neglecting himself. You know, he, he, if there is breathlessness, that means there is significant damage to the myocardium. And if you have, you, you would have quantified the uh, degree of exercise that is precipitating breathlessness, it would have been even more useful. And he has chest pain at rest, isn't it? Yes, sir. With STT changes. So what more do you need? And the angiography is there. But angiography is not talking of ejection fraction. Many times they add ejection fraction here also. So, uh, and he's diabetic, isn't it? He's diabetic and he's on IABP. So there are all these parameters. They tell me that this patient is a very high risk. 
but let us know more about this patient. So what would you like to know? Let me, without going to the next slide, let me try to find out from you. What exactly do, would you like to know? What more would you like to know in this patient? Um, sir, I would like to know the, I would like to get a 12 lead ECG for this patient because it would help me assess the uh, infarction. The 2D echo uh, to um, help yes. me get an idea of ventricular yes. dysfunction and the cardiac yes. enzymes also. Echo would be very important. That is number one. Secondly, I would like to know what inotropes is he on because he is on IABP. So he must be on one or two inotropes, at least two, maybe on high dosage. The third thing I would like to know, is he on ventilator or is he maintaining oxygenation or not adequately? So these are the issues as an anesthesiologist, which I would like to know. The moment I get a call for such type of patients, I would send my resident to have a look at him and tell him that these are the issues that I would like to know so that I can prepare the OR accordingly. Okay. This patient looks like to me is going to undergo emergency CAVG, isn't it? That's what yes, you are sir. mentioning. Yes, sir. Emergency angiography and SOS angioplasty. But angioplasty is probably not uh, successful or whatever. I do not know. We'll know only uh, next time uh, in the next slide. But even without an, uh, him being subjected to surgical procedure, you may be required uh, to you know, assist the cardiologist in the cath lab for carrying out the stenting procedure. Do you agree or not? Yes, I do agree. Ah, so I would be ready to intubate him and put him on ventilator and you know all these issues, they, they come in my mind. So let us see what is the next slide showing us. Uh, so all blood investigations are normal, chest x-ray is normal, ECG shows LVH and ST segment depression in V1 to V5 with T-wave inversion. 2D echo shows mildly dilated LV, mild hypokinesia of distal interventricular septum and anterior wall and mid and inferior wall. Ejection fraction is 25 to 30 percent, mild MR. And the, so the plan is emergency oh. CAV. So he's for emergency CAVG. So his ejection fraction is also less and there is also hypokinesia and also akinesia. Akinesia? No. There is no, only hypokinesia, isn't hypokinesia. it? Hypokinesia. But he's on, uh, he's on IABP supports, which means that he's not able to maintain his hemodynamics. And this kind of paradox is there many times in patients who suffer from uh, coronary artery disease. Uh, patients who have very mild disease can, you know, behave very abnormally and versus those who have severe disease, they will, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, will sail through very easily. So that kind of paradox I have also noted many times in uh, these patients. So the fact that this patient is uh, on IABP, I would have expected uh, severe uh, hypokinesia, not mild, and maybe global akinesia or global hypokinesia in this patient with EF of around 20% or so only then uh, IABP would be required. So uh, have you understood what things I would like to know? You, ECHO you have provided, uh, but the other ABG and other things are still lacking, isn't it? These are very important parameters and the information about the inotropes. So if he, this patient uh, is going to be in the theater, I, would you not like to get ready with your inotropes and keep the infusion pumps set at the yes. dosage that he's receiving and the ventilatory parameters uh, as those that are already uh, being set on this patient. And if he's not on ventilator, would you not be ready to intubate him as soon as possible? Yes, sir. Connect yes. him to the monitors as soon as possible, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So he stands a higher risk as per the STS guidelines. Also, the patients on uh, IABP, they have a significant risk of mortality. Okay, they have a significant risk of mortality. Okay, anything else you have in this patient? No, sir. No, you have any other scenario? Uh, so same patient. Uh, is this patient over or you have some more slides? No, sir. Uh, so regarding this patient, uh, the further preoperative optimization. So I'm speaking uh -huh. about acute coronary syndrome because this patient okay, has... Okay, yes, yes. Okay, yes. go on. Uh, so it is also called as unstable angina pectoris, unstable coronary syndrome or crescendo angina. And uh, the presentation is angina that is more frequent or of longer duration or occurs with less exercise or at rest. This symptoms indicates rapid growth, rupture or embolus of an existing plug. Patients in this category... Oh, are this patient had symptoms for eight months, Dr. Gargi. Patient yes, had sir. breathlessness for eight months. Yes, sir. So uh, you, uh, you still think that this is acute? Co it precipitated in an acute manner at the time of presentation. That's why he presented in emergency. Um, no, sir. So what makes you think that this is acute coronary syndrome? Did he present in hemodynamic uh, unstable condition to the hospital? That needs to be clarified. You know, this is a small issue here. Uh, about this patient. So he may have just come. Did he present in emergency or did he yes, present he in the. 
emergency. He presented in emergency. Yes, sir. So uh, a patient may be harboring this 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 disease for last eight months and then suddenly he deteriorated. So he presented. That can happen. Yes. Okay. So acute coronary syndrome. Right. Go on. Uh, a diagnostic and revascularization procedures are central to the management of these patients having acute coronary syndrome. Medical therapy, including dual antiplatelet therapy and anti ischemic therapy, often accompany or precede these procedures. Uh, now, talking about emergency CABG, which this patient is posted for, the indications of emergency CABG are patients with left main coronary stenosis, history of failed PCI, ongoing ischemia despite maximal non surgical therapy, or angiographic accident, mm -hmm. including puncture or a dissection. Um, and sometimes these patients are often supported with an intraaortic balloon pump. Uh, so let us keep the yes. Uh, I have got a question to ask uh, from Dr. Gargi. Hmm? Yes, sir. Yeah. A simple question: How do you differentiate between stable and unstable angina? Uh, so stable angina means that the patient is having chest pain, but uh, it is there after a certain amount of exercise, which gets relieved after the patient takes rest or after the patient takes nitrates. Unstable angina is the um, uh, the frequency of the uh, stable uh, the stable angina. Uh, the frequency of the anginal episodes is increased, the severity is increased, the patient starts to get chest pain uh, on a less amount of exercise which the patient wouldn't, uh, he, he used to not get angina initially or the patient starts having chest pain even at rest and um, it, at least it lasts for 30 minutes, it doesn't get relieved by nitrates also, it doesn't get relieved by rest. So, so that is unstable angina. So, one more what is mental angina? So, principal angina is a uh, variant angina. It's also called as vasospastic angina. It generally occurs because of coronary vasospasm and it is uh, not generally associated to the exercise or the emotional outburst of the patient. It is at rest. It is at rest. Yeah, carry on, please. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Gargi, let us leave the management part out of this discussion because we are only assessing the risk. The topic was risk assessment. So, you have shown one patient who was for elective CAVG with very uh, usual normal risk and this another patient who was for emergency surgery uh, with an enhanced risk. And we have learned how to assess the risk based on the functional capacity and the symptoms and the ECG findings and the presence or absence of IAVP and the LV function. Uh, yes, sir. What are you? What else do you want to tell us about this patient? Uh, so just about the uh, intraoperative, <laughs> little preoperative and intraoperative management of this patient who's posted for emergency. Be brief um, because management is not the subject matter for today. So just okay. highlight the management issues. Uh, so one thing is that these patients who have already uh, they have been shifted from catheterization lab to the OT. They would have received heparin prior to coronary angiography. They would have received start doses of oral aspirin and clopidogrel. So there would be a derangement of coagulation. And now the patient is planned for emergency CAPG in which we are planning to take all the invasive lines, the advanced hemodynamic monitoring, uh, swan gans catheter, central line, uh, for monitoring of pulmonary arterial pressure, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and even transesophageal echocardiography. So all the securing invasive lines will be associated with the risk of hematoma. So uh, that is one thing, sir. So that can be prevented by uh, using UST guidance for securing invasive lines and getting a baseline activated clotting time and a complete blood count. Uh, to know how much derangement is there. If there is a derangement, then we keep all the blood and the blood products ready and under FFP cover and the cryoprecipitate or platelet cover, we can secure the invasive lines. Moreover, there will be a chance of increased bleeding during the surgery because of which we have to keep blood products ready intraoperatively also. So and, uh, it's a good uh, summary of the targets or the goals of anesthesia or the problems that these patients are likely to have. You have some more things to say. Okay. Uh, and so these patients are posted for emergency surgery, so they will be prone for hypotension. Uh, so vasopressors and inotropes should be kept ready. Um, and so these are the other investigations which we would like to have, but we have already discussed about it. And uh, most importantly, monitoring, uh, taking a high risk consent of the patient is very important prior to taking him up inside the operation theater, considering all the risk factors for emergency CABG. So, in fact, all the organs are at risk in this particular patient. Not only heart, but the kidneys, the brains, and other things are also at risk. And they are also likely to die. So, the very high risk consent uh, is required in this patient. But from the anesthetist's point of view, you must understand that 
there is a uh, your role is in terms of maintaining of his oxygenation maintaining his hemodynamics manipulation of uh, inotropes and managing the iabp and post operative ventilation these would be the parameters and of managing the uh, on pumps presuming that he will be on pump uh, by uh, cabg but patients who are on off uh, on iabp can also be operated off pump cabg so but we we'll leave this discussion out of this presentation yes sir. okay yes, sir. next uh so this is nothing but assessment of perioperative myocardial injury which we talked about echocardiography new, uh, all these investigations we would like to get um, biomarkers there is something new uh, here biomarkers just uh, mention about the biomarkers because uh, perioperative uh, good uh, indicators these are good markers yes so for so the earliest biomarker to rise after myocardial infarction ischemia is myoglobin which rises within 2 hours uh, it peaks within 6 to 8 hours and it disappears within 24 hours and then is the creatinine kinase it rises within 4 to 6 hours uh, peaks within 12 to 24 hours and um, um, the levels decrease after 48 hours troponin and some more specific troponin i and troponin t and they start rising after uh, 24 to 48 hours and they uh, peak after 72 hours and their levels uh, remain in the blood till 7 to 10 days so troponin some more specific biomarkers of uh, myocardial injury okay so you can do that also in the post operative period okay next and so the last case scenario is okay. uh, a 33 year old female who presented with breathlessness on exertion since last 4 years and she is now having fatigue and dyspnea with minimal exertion 3 months ago she also had an acute onset of left sided hemiplegia now she has residual slight residual hemiparesis the power is 4 by 5 no history of cuff expectoration orthopnea no other comorbidities she is on digoxin tablet furosemide and tablet warfarin which was stopped 3 days ago she is a poorly built lady malnourished weight is 42 kg irregularly irregular pulse 98 per minute bp is 110 by 62 jvp is not elevated no clubbing sinuses pallor uh, no, stay there just stay there so this type of scenario is fortunately becoming rarer in our countries nowadays because it used to be fairly common uh, in the earlier days but fortunately nowadays they are not allowed to remain breathlessness on exertion for four years and yes. fatigue and dyspnea and also suffering a stroke so it uh, it indicates to me that the patient has a mitral stenosis and with a thrombus in the left atrial appendage maybe atrial fibrillation and all these things so she poor lady should have undergone surgery long time ago and she was neglected or she belonged to a poor class and was not cardiologist maybe took time or managed her without referring uh, to the surgeon as soon as possible or maybe the facility was not available so based on this scenario what do you think about the risk in this patient um so the risk seems to be high for her uh, considering her clinical picture so the risk seems to be high why do you say so what what is the severity of the disease let us talk in terms of severity of the disease. we mentioned i mentioned that if the risk is more if the disease is more severe now here based on the symptoms what do you think about the severity of the disease um so she is now so she is having dyspnea with minimal exertion that means she is nyh grade 3 and uh, so if we classify mitral stenosis uh, into mild moderate and severe based upon clinical symptoms then nyh uh, grade 3 so comes in um, severe stenosis severe mitral stenosis yes and if you again quantify the breathlessness on exertion the degree of exertion if you classify you would have more information okay so yes. based on the symptoms but here is one more catch if she is on receiving uh, you know uh, digoxin and lasix then the, the uh, class 4 symptom can be converted into class 3 so i assume that she is not being treated by cardiologist by these two medicines and she has presented she has been carrying on with with these symptoms for the last few years so please ensure that you do look at what medicines that the patient is receiving if she is receiving some diuretics and digoxin then this may actually be a grade 4 nyh4 and because yes, of these medicines she is you know having a, a improvement in the symptoms in addition she has a, Of the history of hemiplegia, which indicates the presence of thrombus, which indirectly means that she has atrial fibrillation. And atrial yes. fibrillation, you know, what happens if the LA is enlarged severely. If the LA is enlarged severely, that means the disease has been long-standing, yes, and sir. it is more severe. So you know, this is how if you extrapolate, to me it appears to be a very high risk based on only these parameters that you are showing. Yes, but sir. her BP is 110 by 62, which is unlike uh, my severe mitral stenosis. It would be usually within between 90 to 100. So blood pressure is uh, the only parameter. 
but overall appears to be severe and i would like to know her echocardiography results straight away because that is what will you know clinch the my assumption or my uh, anticipation in this patient so uh, can you show me the, us the yes, echo picture uh, so there is severe mitral stenosis mitral valve area is 0.9 cm square dilated la size is 5.2 cm pulmonary arterial pressure is also 65 mmg and ejection fraction is 55% and at present there is no clot in the left atrium so there is a uh, severe mitral stenosis the la size is not that big if you can show the x ray do you have x ray or no uh, so ct ratio is 0.5 there is a double atrial shadow and bilateral lung fields are clear so there are a lot of contradictory things there double atrial shadow at a uh, dilated stenosis of 5.2 cm is not uh, really possible so virtual scenario that you have created is not you know corresponding either the uh, size measurement is incorrect or the double density is an incorrect uh, finding so you understand what how yes, i am trying to correlate yes, all the findings together everything should match not necessarily so all everything may not match because there are errors and sometimes surprises so the valve area may not match uh, this uh, uh, based on your symptoms and other things because sometimes the, the exertion itself will produce tachycardia or atrial fibrillation transient and patient becomes symptomatic so all these issues are there so uh, but overall what i am trying to teach you that you should look at corroborate all your findings right from the history till the examination and the investigations they must corroborate with each other if they are not you should you know go back and reinvestigate and see why they are not corroborating and you will get the answer mm -hmm. so this patient is uh, i think a high risk according to you yes sir it is a high risk uh there's a mitral is valve area is also, so the um, 0.9 isn't it yes sir there is severe ph mean of pulmonary artery yes what type of ph is this likely to be i mentioned in my presentation this is so, pre capillary or post capillary what is the likely sorry so, um could no, hear you is this likely to be pre capillary or post capillary more likely to be post capillary because you know this is because of stenosis and unless it is long standing it will lead to you know pre capillary changes and the hypertension will not respond after surgery but the degree of ph if you see the pulmonary artery pressure is 65 which is not too high so the mean pressure may be less than 40 in this patient uh we have seen patients who have a pa pressure equal to systemic pressure so pa systolic of more than 80 in mitral valve disease is considered as severe ph and is likely to be pre capillary in nature and okay. they are not likely to decrease after surgery and they are likely to carry you know the uh, high risk of morbidity and mortality and their symptoms may not improve to mm -hmm. the extent that they would in a patient who has post capillary uh, pulmonary artery hypertension Okay. okay so this patient is for mitral valve replacement plus mace procedure nowadays mace procedure is not performed in her return can i intervene dr sure. tempe no most of us yes please please go ahead uh, i think the difference between pre capillary and post capillary pulmonary hypertension may not be clear to the post graduates okay so that is why i wanted three or four students so the Darvi, have you understood what is pre-capillary and what is post-capillary? Let me ask you. Oh, yeah. uh, no, sir. I'll, I'll read about it. So, okay. if you if you uh, look at the pulmonary artery, it will you know divide into arterioles, then yes, the sir. venules, yes, and sir. then the veins would uh, converge to form the pulmonary vein. And uh, so, the uh, if the pulmonary arteriole undergoes changes, it becomes thickened. Then yes, it sir. leads to those changes do not Uh, uh, reverse after the valve replacement so this is right. pre capillary pre capillary yes, and sir. here the gradient uh, may be higher transpulmonary gradient that is the pressure difference between the pulmonary artery and the wedge pressure would be more than 40 so this is pre capillary and post capillary means there are not much changes in the at the level of uh, uh, arterioles and capillaries but they are mainly reactive in the sense that because there is high volume of blood into the pulmonary vasculature yes. the pulmonary venules and all the vasculature constricts it doesn't want it to you know uh, reach it 
So that's the yes, reaction. Yes. When the, you uh, increase the blood volume in a given cavity, it will like to constrict. It will like to yes, protect sir. itself. So yes, this sir. is what is the reactive pH, and this will disappear after the valve has been replaced. Right, right. Sir, so understood. this is what is pre-capillary and post-capillary. In this patient, if a PA pressure is uh, 65 millimeters of mercury, it is less likely to have pre-capillary hypertension because normally the patients who have pre-capillary pH will have a systolic PA pressure of more than 80. Mm -hmm. This is what has been shown by some of yes. the papers. So yes. is it clear to you now? Yes, sir, clear, sir. So if it is uh, clear to a first year postgraduate, I think that it should be clear to most of the postgraduates that are listening to this discussion. Okay. Oh, is that all right, Dr. Nima, or you want to add something else? No, no, yeah, this is no, just one thing. That pre-capillary yes. hypertension, you generally see in congenital heart disease patients, while post-capillary, you generally see it in mitral wall disease patients. Yes, yes. So all valvular disease, even the uh, uh, the uh, functional yes. MR that you have in patients with uh, uh, LV dysfunction or in, after coronary artery disease, they will also have post-capillary. Post and also the, uh, the primary pulmonary hypertension or idiopathic pulmonary hypertension that you know of, which we do not deal with normally, uh, is also pre-capillary in nature. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Got it. Is that enough, Dr. Uh, yeah, enough, 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 sir, enough. Okay. Enough. So if, if this is so much of answer is given by a student in the examination, I will give him 75% uh, marks. Uh, so, sir, regarding uh, th this patient who is on warfarin, um, uh, uh -huh. we will talk about the anticoagulants and antithrombotic medications and their perioperative continuation. Uh, so first one is warfarin, which is a vitamin K antagonist, and it has to be stopped five days prior to the elective surgery. Because at least although, five days. At, at least, least five days. Yes, ideally sir. seven days, but at least five days. Five days. At uh, least three so, days. Sometimes in an urgent kind of situation, maybe three days also some people have accepted. Yes. But uh, ideal time frame is seven days. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. And uh, one day prior to the surgery, the INR should be checked. The I accepted INR is less than 1.5 when the patient is on warfarin and when it is stopped at least five days prior to the surgery. Now, if the patient is on clopidogrel, we stop it ideally one week prior to the surgery. Ticlopidin, because of its longer duration of action, because it's the levels of ticlopidin stay in the blood at least for 14 days. So we ask it to be stopped two weeks prior to the surgery. And GP2B3A inhibitors, including apsiximab, iftifitabide, and terofibin, they should be stopped 48 hours prior to the surgery. So this is regarding anti- But uh, what should they be replaced with? Will you just uh, discontinue heparin. them? Heparin, ah, sir. Tell me, which type of heparin? And when would uh, you discontinue that? Uh, so no, so we use a bridging therapy for the patient when we discontinue these medications. So the bridging therapy is given by uh, low molecular weight heparin. Uh -huh. uh, uh, depending on the renal function, if the renal parameters are deranged, then we discontinue L LMWH and then we uh, keep the patient on unfractionated heparin. So when would you discontinue this? Low molecular uh, weight heparin or fractionated heparin? Sir, uh, this is a th uh, therapeutic dose of the heparin, which is the, which the patient is receiving. So ideally, the low molecular weight therapeutic dose of heparin should be discontinued 24 hours prior to the surgery. Okay. And fractionated heparin? Um, so six, six to 12 So it can be carried on. Actually, heparin can be carried on because if you are also going to heparinize your patients and it is not going to go cause much of bleeding problem. It can be neutralized easily by protein. But usually we put them on low molecular weight heparin. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, next. Uh, second is the arrhythmias because patients which are posted for valve surgery, cardiac dysrhythmia, cardiac arrhythmias can be common. And uh, here we are speaking about atrial fibrillation because this patient came with atrial fibrillation. So initial management of AFib will be control of the heart rate by means of intravenous calcium channel blockers, beta blockers or amiodarone. Um, um, stable re-entrant tachycardias, they can be managed by vagal maneuvers and adenosine. Uh, supraventricular tachycardias, if associated with hemodynamic instability, require immediate cardioversion. Surgical and catheter ablation therapies are also available, which benefit the patients who are not responding to medical therapy. And uh, most importantly, if we have started the patient on amiodarone, but if the rate and rhythm is controlled, then it is advisable to stop amiodarone 48 hours prior to the surgery because it can cause hypotension and there's a possibility of heart block also with amiodarone. 
Yes, in this patient, I would like to say that the, usually the atrial fibrillation in patients with valvular heart disease is chronic in nature. It does not respond to cardioversion or other measures. You Therefore, you should usually rely on the rate control measures such as beta blockers yes, or digoxin in this patient. So, and uh, you should try to accept, define what is an acceptable heart rate because in these patients, uh, you may not be able to get a heart rate of 82, 90 or 70 that you usually like to have in patients with mitral stenosis. Uh, they yes. will have a higher heart rate and you may have to decide as to what is an acceptable heart rate in this patient. Acceptable heart rate is the one in which wherein you have a acceptable blood pressure. So what is acceptable blood pressure? Anything more than 90 in a tight mitral stenosis is, ex is acceptable to me. So I would like to ensure the, that the heart rate stays to such level that the blood pressure is at least 90. 90. If it is 100, even all the uh, even better. So here, you know, the uh, usually they are not treated by uh, amiodarone and medicines like that. Beta blockers and maybe uh, digoxin is the drug of choice here. And cardioversion is a resort for uh, only those situations where the hemodynamics really get disturbed and it's not you are not able to maintain due to very uh, fast atrial fibrillation. Uh, so this patient is therefore you are going you are saying that he will undergo mace procedure but as i mentioned mace procedure is rarely performed nowadays it's a very time consuming a very complex and a very bloody operation if you, if i use the word uh, if you allow me to use that word uh, nowadays what the most surgeons they do that in uh, not all but some surgeons and i like those surgeons who like to uh, you know address this atrial fibrillation they use radio frequency ablation or cauterize around these two SVC, SVC and IVC and coronary sinus and the fossa ovalis and one or two more areas i don't i'm not sure which areas and by that you know they are able to control the uh, arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation in many patients. So at least an effort should be made to you know, target or treat the atrial fibrillation in addition to replacement of the valve because if you leave the atrial fibrillation then the anticoagulation has to be carried out and they are still liable to you know uh, have thrombosis and the valve may get occluded and there are many complications uh, as a result of atrial fibrillation. So next, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so the next set of arrhythmias is ventricular arrhythmias and ventricular tachycardia. If the patient is pre pre presenting with these arrhythmias, so uh, especially if it is a ventricular arrhythmia associated with LV dysfunction and ejection fraction less than 30 to 35 percent, they can be managed with prophylactic implantation of an implantable cardioverter defibrillator or else beta blockers and amidurone can also be used in which patients right. who are not controlled. So this is slightly um, out of our today's of discussion, but yes. never mind, you have given some more information. Next. And uh, next is bradycardia, that means heart block. So symptomatic patients or patients with Mobitz type 2 block or complete heart block should be considered for permanent pacing or patients with recent MI or both with first degree heart block and bundle branch block may need temporary pacing. So this is post-operative. This is post-operatively, but uh, if pre-operatively, if you are dealing with uh, any bradyarrhythmia, maybe even first degree or second degree heart block, then you should make all the efforts on, because card for the cardiologist, the indication for temporary pacing is only when he's symptomatic. Without yeah. that, he, he's going to say that uh, type 1 block or type 2 uh, Mobit star, type 2 block, he is not going to insert the uh, uh, temporary pacemaker. But if you tell him that there are certain maneuvers that can be very much vagotonic during surgical procedure, such as intubation or retractions and certain other things, then he may agree to insert the pacemaker. So preoperatively, uh, of course, this does not relate to the atrial fibrillation that we are talking about in this mitral stenosis, but maybe in a patient who has coronary artery disease, in that patient, there may be bradyarrhythmia. So you please ensure that when you refer, if you just refer the patient to the cardiologist, he will say that no, he's okay. Yes. Nothing is required. But if you tell him that you are concerned about, you know, uh, initiating a complete heart block in this patient because of intense vagotonic maneuvers that you may perform or the surgeon may perform, then he will say for the safety reason, let us have a TPI inserted or at the most, let us have a some other pacing, uh, percutaneous pacing or is transesophageal pacing mode available in the theater so that you do not, you know, uh, produce this complication. Okay. Yes, next. sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and sir, these are the factors which are unrelated to our previously discussed case. There are just three factors. Um, so yes. the first factor is stroke. 
so if the patient has stroke then the patient can have or history of stroke uh, he would be having a high risk of increased perioperative stroke after cardiopulmonary bypass because of all hemodynamic alterations the second one is cigarette smoking uh, acute effects of smoking include increased coronary vascular resistance by direct vasoconstrictor effect of nicotine increased carboxyhemoglobin levels which causes decreased systemic oxygen transport so can cause uh, disturbed supply demand balance plus it causes enhanced thrombosis endothelial damage and chronic inflammation so optimization of this patient would be cessation of smoking for 2 8 weeks but obviously it would be applicable if only the patient is posted for an elective surgery and okay. uh, the last factor is chest physiotherapy a decrease in pulmonary function is important because we do median stenotomies and thoracic expansion will be limited and then chances of atelectasis and pneumonia could happen so perioperative chest physiotherapy should be encouraged if the patient is planned for an elective surgery okay so thank you dr garg